Preface When I began working on this book ten years ago, I had two different ideas about what the topic might be. First, I was interested in explaining why post-Cold War U.S. foreign policy was so prone to failure, sometimes disastrous failure. I was especially interested in explaining America's fiascos in the greater Middle East, which continued to accumulate, and the steady deterioration of U.S.-Russian relations, which culminated in a major rupture over Ukraine in 2014. This subject was all the more interesting because there was so much optimism in the early 1990s about America's role in the world. I wanted to figure out what went wrong. Second, I aspired to write a book about how liberalism, nationalism, and realism interact to affect relations among states. I have long considered nationalism a remarkably powerful force in international politics, but I had never examined that topic in detail. I had written a good deal about realism, however, and explored its differences with liberalism in several earlier works. I thought that it would be interesting to write a book comparing and contrasting these three isms, especially since I knew of no article or book that did this. As I thought about the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, and realism, I came to realize that this trichotomy provided an ideal template for explaining the failures of U.S. foreign policy since 1989, and especially since 2001. At that point, my two reasons for writing this book fit together rather neatly. My basic argument is that the United States was so powerful in the aftermath of the Cold War that it could adopt a profoundly liberal foreign policy, commonly referred to as liberal hegemony. The aim of this ambitious strategy is to turn as many countries as possible into liberal democracies, while also fostering an open international economy and building formidable international institutions. In essence, the United States has sought to remake the world in its own image. Proponents of this policy, which is widely embraced in the American foreign policy establishment, believe it will make the world more peaceful and ameliorate the dual problems of nuclear proliferation and terrorism. It will reduce human rights violations and make liberal democracies more secure against internal threats. From the beginning, however, liberal hegemony was destined to fail, and it did. This strategy invariably leads to policies that put a country at odds with nationalism and realism, which ultimately have far more influence on international politics than liberalism does. This basic fact of life is difficult for most Americans to accept. The United States is a deeply liberal country whose foreign policy elite have an almost knee-jerk hostility toward both nationalism and realism, but this kind of thinking can only lead to trouble on the foreign policy front. American policymakers would be wise to abandon liberal hegemony and pursue a more restrained foreign policy based on realism and a proper understanding of how nationalism constrains great powers. The deeper roots of this book go back to my days as a graduate student at Cornell University. In the fall of 1976, I took the field seminar in political theory taught by Professor Isaac Kramnik. The class, which introduced students to the writings of seminal thinkers like Plato, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Marx, had a greater impact on me than any other course I have ever taken. Indeed, I still have my notebook from that class, and over the years, I have consulted it at least 50 times. Three aspects of that seminar made it central to my intellectual development. First, I learned much about all sorts of isms, including liberalism, nationalism, and realism, and the course lent itself to contrasting them against each other. Second, it taught me that theory is indispensable for understanding how the world works. The reason I have referred back to the course notebook so many times is that I remembered particular arguments those theorists made that had significant implications for contemporary political issues. Third, I learned that one may talk and write about important theoretical issues in simple, clear language that is accessible to non-experts. Although it was often hard to figure out exactly what the famous theorists on our reading list were saying, Professor Kramnik's ability to spell out their theories in straightforward language not only made them easy to understand, but also made it clear why they are important. The Great Delusion is intended to be theoretical at its core. The premise underlying the book is that theory is essential for understanding policy issues. But in the spirit of Isaac Kramnik, I have gone to great lengths to spell out my arguments as clearly as possible so that any well-educated and interested listener can grasp them. To put it bluntly, my aim is to be a great communicator, not a great obfuscator. Only the listener, of course, can determine whether I have succeeded. I could not have written this book without the help of many very smart people. My greatest debt is to four individuals whose fingerprints are all over it. Eliza Yorgi, Mariah Grinberg, 
Sebastian Rosato, and Stephen Wald. They not only made critically important conceptual points that caused me to alter particular arguments, but also spotted contradictions that I had missed and gave sage advice on how to reorganize chapters as well as the book's overall structure. The manuscript went through five major drafts before I turned it over to Yale University Press. In November 2016, after the second major draft, I had a book workshop featuring six scholars from outside the University of Chicago, Daniel Dudney, Matthew Coker, John Owen, Sebastian Rosato, Stephen Walt, and Alexander Wendt, who were kind enough to read the entire manuscript and spent eight hours critiquing it in detail. Their feedback, both at the workshop and in subsequent email and phone exchanges, led me to make numerous changes, some of them fundamental. Other participants in that book workshop, including my good friend Thomas Durkin, gave me sage advice on how the pursuit of liberal hegemony threatens civil liberties at home and facilitates the growth of a national security state. I also had the good fortune of having all my international relations colleagues at the University of Chicago, Austin Carson, Robert Gulati, Charles Lipson, Robert Pape, Paul Post, Michael J. Reese, and Paul Staniland, participate in the discussion. They, too, offered excellent comments that helped me tighten some arguments and force me to alter others. I owe a special debt of gratitude to Sean Lynn Jones, who read the entire manuscript and gave me a detailed set of comments that helped me refine the final version of the manuscript. I am especially grateful to my editor at Yale University Press, William Frucht, who did a superb job of editing that final version. He pushed me hard to tighten particular arguments, while he streamlined virtually all of them in ways that helped make the book more reader-friendly. Liz Schuler, with some help from John Donahue, did a fine job of copy editing, and Karen Olson handled the logistics efficiently and cheerfully. Many other individuals helped me, some in small ways, some in big ways, produce this book. They include Senor Akturk, Zeynep Bulutgil, John Caverly, Michael Dash, Alexander Downs, Charles Glazer, Barack Kadurkin, Brian Leiter, Jennifer A. Lind, Gabriel Mares, Max Mearsheimer, Nicholas Mearsheimer, Rajan Manon, Nuno Montero, Francesca Morgan, Valerie Morkivicius, John Mueller, Sankar Muthu, David Nirenberg, Lindsay O'Rourke, Joseph Parent, Don Renault, Marie-Eve Rennie, Michael Rosal, John Schusler, James Scott, Yubin Sheng, Tom Switzer, and the two anonymous reviewers for Yale University Press. I would like to thank Ian Shapiro, the Henry R. Luce Director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale, who invited me to give the Henry L. Stimson Lectures for 2017. The three lectures that I gave at Yale are, in effect, the central ingredients of this book. I would also like to express my appreciation to the University of Chicago, which has been my intellectual home for more than 35 years and has generously supported the research that went into producing not only this book, but virtually everything I have written since I started there as an assistant professor in 1982. In addition, I want to thank the Charles Koch Foundation for helping to fund my research and the book workshop. I especially appreciate the support of William Ruger, its vice president for research. I have been fortunate over the years to have top-notch administrative assistants who not only have helped me with the everyday logistical demands of being a professor and scholar, but have also done significant amounts of research for me. Megan Bolansky, Emma Chilton, Suvik D., Elizabeth Jenkins, and Michael Rowley have all served me well and have contributed in important ways to the making of this book. I am also grateful for all the support I received on the home front from my family, especially from my wife Pamela, who never complained about the endless hours I spent writing and rewriting the book manuscript. Finally, I would like to dedicate this book to all the students I have taught over the years, going back to when I taught my first course at Mohawk Valley Community College in upstate New York in 1974. I'm using the term student here in its broadest sense to include people who have not formally taken a course with me, but have told me that my work has helped shape their thinking. I love teaching because I get great satisfaction from imparting knowledge to students and from helping them come up with their own theories about how the world works. At the same time, I have learned an enormous amount over the years from interacting with students. This is especially true of seminars, where I have often gone into class thinking one way about an article or a book on the syllabus and left thinking about it differently because of something a student said. Teaching large lecture courses has also been an important learning experience, as it has forced me to organize my thoughts on big topics and figure out how to present them in a clear and accessible way. All of this is to say that teaching and working with students over the years has helped shape my thinking about international politics in ways that are reflected in every page of this book. For that, I am forever grateful. 1. The Impossible Dream 
Liberal hegemony is an ambitious strategy in which a state aims to turn as many countries as possible into liberal democracies like itself, while also promoting an open international economy and building international institutions. In essence, the liberal state seeks to spread its own values far and wide. My goal in this book is to describe what happens when a powerful state pursues this strategy at the expense of balance of power politics. Many in the West, especially among foreign policy elites, consider liberal hegemony a wise policy that states should axiomatically adopt. Spreading liberal democracy around the world is said to make eminently good sense from both a moral and a strategic perspective. For starters, it is thought to be an excellent way to protect human rights which are sometimes seriously violated by authoritarian states. And because the policy holds that liberal democracies do not want to go to war with each other, it ultimately provides a formula for transcending realism and fostering international peace. Finally, proponents claim it helps protect liberalism at home by eliminating authoritarian states that otherwise might aid the illiberal forces that are constantly present inside the liberal state. This conventional wisdom is wrong. Great powers are rarely in a position to pursue a full-scale liberal foreign policy. As long as two or more of them exist on the planet, they have little choice but to pay close attention to their position in the global balance of power and act according to the dictates of realism. Great powers of all persuasions care deeply about their survival, and there is always the danger in a bipolar or multipolar system that they will be attacked by another great power. In these circumstances, liberal great powers regularly dress up their hard-nosed behavior with liberal rhetoric. They talk like liberals and act like realists. Should they adopt liberal policies that are at odds with realistic logic, they invariably come to regret it. But occasionally, a liberal democracy encounters such a favorable balance of power that it is able to embrace liberal hegemony. That situation is most likely to arise in a unipolar world, where the single great power does not have to worry about being attacked by another great power, since there is none. Then, the liberal sole pole will almost always abandon realism and adopt a liberal foreign policy. Liberal states have a crusader mentality hardwired into them that is hard to restrain. Because liberalism prizes the concept of inalienable or natural rights, committed liberals are deeply concerned about the rights of virtually every individual on the planet. This universalist logic creates a powerful incentive for liberal states to get involved in the affairs of countries that seriously violate their citizens' rights. To take this a step further, the best way to ensure that the rights of foreigners are not trampled is for them to live in a liberal democracy. This logic leads straight to an active policy of regime change, where the goal is to topple autocrats and put liberal democracies in their place. Liberals do not shy from this task, mainly because they often have great faith in their state's ability to do social engineering, both at home and abroad. Creating a world populated by liberal democracies is also thought to be a formula for international peace, which would not just eliminate war, but greatly reduce, if not eliminate, the twin scourges of nuclear proliferation and terrorism. And lastly, it is an ideal way of protecting liberalism at home. This enthusiasm notwithstanding, liberal hegemony will not achieve its goals, and its failure will inevitably come with huge costs. The liberal state is likely to end up fighting endless wars, which will increase rather than reduce the level of conflict in international politics and thus aggravate the problems of proliferation and terrorism. Moreover, the state's militaristic behavior is almost certain to end up threatening its own liberal values. Liberalism abroad leads to illiberalism at home. Finally, even if the liberal state were to achieve its aims, spreading democracy near and far, fostering economic intercourse, and creating international institutions, they would not produce peace. The key to understanding liberalism's limits is to recognize its relationship with nationalism and realism. This book is ultimately about these three isms and how they interact to affect international politics. Nationalism is an enormously powerful political ideology. It revolves around the division of the world into a wide variety of nations which are formidable social units, each with a distinct culture. Virtually every nation would prefer to have its own state, although not all can. Still, we live in a world populated almost exclusively by nation-states, which means that liberalism must coexist with nationalism. Liberal states are also nation-states. There is no question that liberalism and nationalism can coexist, but when they clash, nationalism almost always wins. The influence of nationalism often undercuts a liberal foreign policy. For example, 
Nationalism places great emphasis on self-determination, which means that most countries will resist a liberal great power's efforts to interfere in their domestic politics, which, of course, is what liberal hegemony is all about. These two isms also clash over individual rights. Liberals believe everyone has the same rights, regardless of which country they call home. Nationalism is a particularist ideology from top to bottom, which means it does not treat rights as inalienable. In practice, the vast majority of people around the globe do not care greatly about the rights of individuals in other countries. They are much more concerned about their fellow citizens' rights, and even that commitment has limits. Liberalism oversells the importance of individual rights. Liberalism is also no match for realism. At its core, liberalism assumes that the individuals who make up any society sometimes have profound differences about what constitutes the good life, and these differences might lead them to try to kill each other. Thus, a state is needed to keep the peace. There is no world state to keep countries at bay when they have profound disagreements. The structure of the international system is anarchic, not hierarchic, which means that liberalism applied to international politics cannot work. Countries thus have little choice but to act according to balance of power logic if they hope to survive. There are special cases, however, where a country is so secure that it can take a break from real politic and pursue truly liberal policies. The results are almost always bad, largely because nationalism thwarts the liberal crusader. My argument, stated briefly, is that nationalism and realism almost always trump liberalism. Our world has been shaped in good part by those two powerful isms, not by liberalism. Consider that 500 years ago, the political universe was remarkably heterogeneous. It included city-states, duchies, empires, principalities, and assorted other political forms. That world has given way to a globe populated almost exclusively by nation-states. Although many factors caused this great transformation, two of the main driving forces behind the modern state system were nationalism and balance of power politics. The American Embrace of Liberal Hegemony This book is also motivated by a desire to understand recent American foreign policy. The United States is a deeply liberal country that emerged from the Cold War as by far the most powerful state in the international system. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 left it in an ideal position to pursue liberal hegemony. The American foreign policy establishment embraced that ambitious policy with little hesitation and with abundant optimism about the future of the United States and the world. At least at first, the broader public shared this enthusiasm. The zeitgeist was captured in Francis Fukuyama's famous article, The End of History, published just as the Cold War was coming to a close. Liberalism, he argued, defeated fascism in the first half of the 20th century and communism in the second half, and now there was no viable alternative left standing. The world would eventually be entirely populated by liberal democracies. According to Fukuyama, these nations would have virtually no meaningful disputes and wars between great powers would cease. The biggest problem confronting people in this new world, he suggested, might be boredom. It was also widely believed at the time that the spread of liberalism would ultimately bring an end to balance of power politics. The harsh security competition that has long characterized great power relations would disappear, and realism, long the dominant intellectual paradigm in international relations, would land on the scrap heap of history. In a world where freedom, not tyranny, is on the march, Bill Clinton proclaimed while campaigning for the White House in 1992, the cynical calculus of pure power politics simply does not compute. It is ill-suited to a new era in which ideas and information are broadcast around the globe before ambassadors can read their cables. Probably no recent president embraced the mission of spreading liberalism more enthusiastically than George W. Bush, who said in a speech in March 2003, two weeks before the invasion of Iraq, The current Iraqi regime has shown the power of tyranny to spread discord and violence in the Middle East, a liberated Iraq and show the power of freedom to transform that vital region by bringing hope and progress into the lives of millions. America's interest in security and America's belief in liberty both lead in the same direction, to a free and peaceful Iraq. Later that year, on September 6, he proclaimed, The advance of freedom is the calling of our time. It is the calling of our country. From the 14 points to the four freedoms to the speech at Westminster, America has put our power at the service of principle. We believe that liberty is the design of nature. We believe that liberty is the direction of history. 
we believe that human fulfillment and excellence come in the responsible exercise of liberty, and we believe that freedom, the freedom we prize, is not for us alone, it is the right and the capacity of all mankind. Something went badly wrong. Most people's view of U.S. foreign policy today, in 2018, is starkly different from what it was in 2003, much less the early 1990s. Pessimism, not optimism, dominates most assessments of America's accomplishments during its holiday from realism. Under Presidents Bush and Barack Obama, Washington has played a key role in sowing death and destruction across the greater Middle East, and there is little evidence the mayhem will end anytime soon. American policy toward Ukraine, motivated by liberal logic, is principally responsible for the ongoing crisis between Russia and the West. The United States has been at war for two out of every three years since 1989, fighting seven different wars. We should not be surprised by this. Contrary to the prevailing wisdom in the West, a liberal foreign policy is not a formula for cooperation and peace, but for instability and conflict. In this book, I focus on the period between 1993 and 2017, when the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations, each in control of American foreign policy for eight years, were fully committed to pursuing liberal hegemony. Although President Obama had some reservations about that policy, they mattered little for how his administration actually acted abroad. I do not consider the Trump administration for two reasons. First, as I was finishing this book, it was difficult to determine what President Trump's foreign policy would look like, although it is clear from his rhetoric during the 2016 campaign that he recognizes that liberal hegemony has been an abject failure and would like to abandon key elements of that strategy. Second, there is good reason to think that with the rise of China and the resurrection of Russian power having put great power politics back on the table, Trump eventually will have no choice but to move toward a grand strategy based on realism, even if doing so meets with considerable resistance at home. The Centrality of Human Nature When scholars assess liberalism's effect on international politics, they usually begin by analyzing a cluster of theories widely seen as the liberal alternatives to realism. Democratic peace theory maintains that liberal democracies do not go to war with each other, but not that they are more peaceful than non-democracies. According to economic interdependence theory, Countries with significant economic relations rarely fight with each other because the costs of war are prohibitive for both sides. Liberal institutionalism claims that states that join international institutions are more likely to cooperate with each other because they will be constrained by the organization's rules, which is almost always in their long-term interest to obey. I will carefully assess each of these theories, but before I do, it is essential to put aside matters of international relations and address more basic questions what liberalism is and what its intellectual foundations are. My aim, in other words, is to begin with the assumptions and logics that sit at the core of liberalism itself and determine whether they make sense. It is enormously important when evaluating theories to examine their foundational assumptions about human nature. John Locke, one of liberalism's founding fathers, put the point well. To understand political power right, we must consider what state all men are naturally in. What is the state all men are naturally in? What distinguishing characteristics do all humans have in common? Answering this question is important, not only for understanding liberalism, but also for understanding nationalism and realism. The more closely any ism accords with human nature, the more relevance it will have in the real world. So I have to spell out my own views about human nature and explain how the common characteristics operate together to affect political life. This ultimately means coming up with a sparse theory of politics that can be used to evaluate and compare liberalism, nationalism, and realism. We need to answer two principal questions about human nature. First, are men and women social beings above all else, or does it make more sense to emphasize their individuality? In other words, are humans fundamentally social animals who strive hard to carve out room for their individuality, or are they individuals who form social contracts? Second, have our critical faculties developed to the point where we can reach some rough moral consensus on what defines the good life? Can we agree on first principles? My view is that we are profoundly social beings from the start to the finish of our lives, and that individualism is of secondary importance, which is not to say that it is unimportant. Second, it is impossible to reach a common understanding about first principles, even though there can be widespread agreement within different groups. 
But because there are no universal truths regarding what constitutes the good life, the disagreements among individuals and groups can be profound. Liberalism downplays the social nature of human beings to the point of almost ignoring it, instead treating people largely as atomistic actors. But liberals wisely emphasize that it is not possible to approach any universal agreement on questions relating to what constitutes the good life. Thus, liberalism is one for two in answering the key questions about human nature. Both nationalism and realism, meanwhile, are in sync with human nature which explains not only why they trump liberalism when they are at odds with it, but also why they are the main driving forces behind international politics. Nationalism and realism pay little attention to individuals and rights and instead see the world in terms of distinct nation-states, reflecting the fact that humans are principally social beings who have fundamentally different views on what constitutes the good life. These differences notwithstanding, all three isms have one important feature in common a profound concern about survival. Nations, I argue, are deeply committed to having their own state because it is the best way to ensure their survival, which can never be taken for granted. States in the international system are also intensely influenced by concerns about survival, which is why they carefully monitor the balance of power and ultimately seek hegemony. Finally, survival is a defining aspect of liberalism, after all, that theory is predicated on the belief that individuals sometimes disagree so strongly about first principles that they try to kill each other. A crucial purpose of the state is to act as a constable and maximize each person's prospects of survival. Political liberalism I have yet to define the term liberalism in any detail. It is important that I do so now because it can mean different things to different people. The same is true of nationalism and realism. It is essential to settle on clear definitions of all these terms because that is the only way to make coherent arguments about how they relate to each other and how they interact to influence international politics. Precise definitions allow scholars to impose order on a messy and complicated body of facts. They also help listeners decide whether an author's arguments are compelling and if not, where and why not. Definitions are neither right nor wrong in the sense of being true or false. We are free to define our core concepts as we see fit. This is not to say, however, that there is no way to discriminate among definitions. The primary criterion for assessing any definition's worth is how useful it is for understanding the phenomenon under study. I have chosen definitions that I hope serve that purpose. Political liberalism in my lexicon is an ideology that is individualistic at its core and assigns great importance to the concept of inalienable rights. This concern for rights is the basis of its universalism. Everyone on the planet has the same inherent set of rights. And this is what motivates liberal states to pursue ambitious foreign policies. The public and scholarly discourse about liberalism since World War II has placed enormous emphasis on what are commonly called human rights. This is true all around the world, not just in the West. Human rights, Samuel Moyne notes, have come to define the most elevated aspirations of both social movements and political entities, state and interstate. They evoke hope and provoke action. Political liberalism is also built on the assumption that individuals sometimes differ intensely about bedrock political and social issues, which necessitates a state that can maintain order if those disputes threaten to turn violent. Relatedly, Liberals place great emphasis on tolerance, a norm that encourages people to respect each other despite their fundamental disagreements. But while they agree on all of these matters, liberals are divided by some fundamental differences. Political liberalism, in fact, comes in two varieties, what some call modus vivendi liberalism and progressive liberalism, a terminology I use throughout this book. There are basically two important differences between them, the first of which concerns how they think about individual rights. Modus vivendi liberals conceive of rights almost exclusively in terms of individual freedoms, by which they mean the freedom to act without fear of government intrusion. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the right to hold property are representative examples of these rights. The government exists to protect these freedoms from threats that might emanate either from within the broader society or from outside it. Progressive liberals prize the same individual freedoms, which are sometimes called negative rights but they are also deeply committed to a set of rights that are actively promoted by the government. They believe, for example, that everyone has a right to equal opportunity, which can be achieved only with active government involvement. Modus vivendi liberals are intensely opposed to this notion of positive rights.
This discussion of individual rights leads to the second important difference between modus vivendi and progressive liberalism. They differ sharply on the role the state should assume beyond keeping the peace at home. Modus vivendi liberals, in line with their emphasis on protecting individual freedoms and their skepticism about positive rights, maintain that the state should involve itself in society as little as possible. Unsurprisingly, they tend to be dismissive about government's ability to do social engineering. Progressive liberals take the opposite view. They prefer an activist state that can promote individual rights, and they have much more faith in the capacity of governments to do social engineering. While there is little doubt that both kinds of political liberalism receive great attention in the world of ideas, in practice, progressive liberalism has triumphed over modus vivendi liberalism. The complexities and demands of life in the modern world leave states with no choice but to be deeply engaged in social engineering, including promoting positive rights. This is not to deny that some states are more involved in this enterprise than others, or that a state's depth of involvement can vary over time. Still, we live in the age of the interventionist state, and there is no reason to think this will change any time soon. Thus, for all intents and purposes, political liberalism in this book is synonymous with progressive liberalism. Three further points about my definition of liberalism are in order. First, two other isms are sometimes categorized as liberal political ideologies, utilitarianism and liberal idealism. One is free to treat them as variants of political liberalism, of course, but I do not, because they operate according to different logics from modus vivendi and progressive liberalism. In particular, neither utilitarianism nor liberal idealism pays much attention to the individual rights, which are at the heart of liberalism. Jeremy Bentham, the intellectual father of utilitarianism, called natural rights rhetorical nonsense, nonsense upon stilts. E. H. Carr's famous book, The Twenty Years' Crisis, written in the late 1930s, is widely considered a classic critique of liberalism as it applies to international politics. In fact, his target is not rights-based liberalism of the sort I discuss here. Carr cares little about either modus vivendi or progressive liberalism, which, at the time, were not highly regarded isms. Instead, he takes dead aim at liberal idealism and utilitarianism, which were much more influential in 1930s Britain. Carr and I thus mean different things when we talk about liberalism, and there is not much overlap in our critiques. None of this is to say that liberal idealism and utilitarianism are unimportant or that they are useless for understanding life in the international system but they are different theories from political liberalism, and assessing their relevance to state behavior would require a separate study. Second, the terms liberalism and democracy are often used interchangeably or linked together in the phrase liberal democracy, but the two concepts are not the same, and it is important to distinguish between them and explain how they relate to each other. I define democracy as a form of government with a broad franchise in which citizens get to choose their leaders in periodic elections. Those leaders then write and implement the rules that govern the polity. Liberalism, on the other hand, is all about individual rights. A liberal state privileges the rights of its citizens and protects them through its laws. It is possible to have an illiberal democracy in which the elected majority tramples on the rights of the minority. This is sometimes referred to as a tyranny of the majority, and one can certainly point to real-world examples. States that are liberal, however, are almost always democratic as well because the concept of inalienable rights clearly implies the right to have a voice in one's own governance through elections. Marcus Fisher puts the point well. The relation between liberalism and democracy is asymmetrical. Liberalism implies democratic institutions to a large degree, whereas democracy entails liberal rights only to a minimal extent. One might argue, however, that liberal states are anti-democratic when minorities make rights-based arguments that obstruct the majority's decisions. While there is no question that this sometimes happens, I do not consider this behavior anti-democratic because the outcome in such cases is based on laws or rules the citizenry democratically adopted. Thus, the term liberal state, as used in this book, means a liberal democracy. Third, some listeners might hear this audiobook as a sweeping attack on liberalism and conclude I am hostile to that political ideology. That would be wrong. It is essential to distinguish the way liberalism operates inside a country from the way it functions in the international system. My views about liberalism are different for each of these realms. Within countries, I believe liberalism is a genuine force for good, 
and it is highly desirable to live in a country that privileges and protects individual rights. I consider myself especially fortunate to have been born and lived all my life in liberal America. Liberalism at the international level, however, is a different matter. States that pursue ambitious liberal foreign policies, as the United States has done in recent years, end up making the world less peaceful. Moreover, they risk undermining liberalism at home, an outcome that should strike fear into the heart of every liberal. A Roadmap My views on human nature and politics are developed at length in Chapter 2. There, I lay out my basic theory of politics, which I will use in subsequent chapters to analyze liberalism, nationalism, and realism. In Chapter 3, I describe political liberalism, paying careful attention to the similarities and differences between modus vivendi and progressive liberalism, and explain why political liberalism today is largely progressive liberalism. I also briefly consider utilitarianism and liberal idealism and explain why I do not consider them liberal theories. In Chapter 4, I take up the key problems with political liberalism. I examine the relationship between liberalism and nationalism, as well as the limits of liberal claims about universal rights. By this point, I will have paid hardly any attention to how liberalism relates to international politics. My aim in the first half of the book is simply to understand what liberalism is about. I begin zeroing in on how liberalism affects the international system in Chapter 5, where I consider in detail the relationship between liberalism and realism. My central argument is that on the rare occasions when states are in a position to adopt liberal hegemony, it usually leads to failed diplomacy and failed wars. I also explain how nationalism and realism, not liberalism, are largely responsible for creating a modern international system that is almost wholly populated with nation-states. Finally, I assess the likelihood of a world state, which, if it materialized, would profoundly change the relevance of liberalism for international politics. The core argument in Chapter 6 is that a state pursuing liberal hegemony does not simply court failure, it suffers significant costs in doing so. Such states invariably end up fighting endless wars, which serve to increase rather than reduce international conflict. I also describe how this liberal militarism usually ends up inflicting huge costs on the target state while endangering liberalism at home. I make the case in Chapter 7 that even if a liberal foreign policy were to achieve its principal goals, spreading liberal democracy widely, creating an open world economy, and building lots of impressive international institutions, that would not lead to a more peaceful world. There would still be security competition with serious potential for war. The reason is that each of the three theories underpinning the expectation that liberal hegemony will radically transform international politics democratic peace theory, economic interdependence theory, and liberal institutionalism has fundamental flaws. I conclude in Chapter 8 with some observations about the future trajectory of American foreign policy. I assess the prospects that the United States will abandon liberal hegemony and adopt a more restrained foreign policy based on realism, coupled with recognition of the fact that nationalism sharply limits the ability of great powers to directly intervene in the politics of other states. I also offer some cautious observations on President Trump's likely effect on American foreign policy during his tenure in the White House. To sum up, the discussion about human nature in Chapter 2 focuses on the traits of individuals. The analysis of political liberalism in Chapters 3 and 4 concentrates on how it relates to a country's domestic politics, and the discussion in Chapters 5 through 8 concerns how that ism relates to international politics. This basic template, of course, reflects the three levels of analysis, individual, unit, and system, that ultimately concern all students of international relations. 2. Human Nature and Politics Beliefs about human nature are the building blocks of theoretical arguments in politics, and liberalism is no exception. Its core claims are based on a set of assumptions about human nature, meaning those attributes that are common to all people, as opposed to those that vary among individuals. Thus, to assess liberalism, we must first describe what it says about human nature and determine whether those claims square with what we know about the human condition. The conservative French thinker Joseph de Mestre maintained that there is no such thing as man in the world. In my lifetime, I have seen Frenchmen, Italians, Russians, etc., Thanks to Montesquieu, I even know that one can be Persian. But as for man, 
I declare that I have never in my life met him. If he exists, he is unknown to me. Of course, there are important differences among peoples as well as people, and those differences are central to the arguments in this book. Yet certain features are permanent and distinctive in almost every person, and these can provide the micro-foundations for a simple theory of politics that can then be employed to evaluate liberalism and its relationship to nationalism and realism. My main aim in this chapter is to present my own thinking about human nature and politics. I begin with two simple assumptions, the first of which concerns our critical faculties. There is no question humans have an impressive capacity to reason. Still, this capacity has significant limits, especially when it comes to answering essential questions about what constitutes the good life. Almost everyone agrees that survival is the most important individual goal, because without it, you cannot pursue any other goal. But beyond that, there is often intractable disagreement about the answers to the important ethical, moral, and political questions that all societies confront and which have profound implications for daily life. Those differences over first principles sometimes become so passionate that they create the potential for deadly conflict. That lurking possibility of violence, which leads individuals to fear each other and worry about their survival, applies to relations among societies as well as among individuals. My second assumption is that humans are profoundly social beings. They do not operate as lone wolves, but are born into social groups or societies that shape their identities well before they can assert their individualism. Moreover, Individuals usually develop strong attachments to their group and are sometimes willing to make great sacrifices for their fellow members. Humans are often said to be tribal at their core. The main reason for our social nature is that the best way for a person to survive is to be embedded in a society and to cooperate with fellow members rather than act alone. This is not to deny that individuals sometimes have good reasons to act selfishly and take advantage of other group members. On balance, however, Cooperation trumps selfish behavior. Social groups are survival vehicles. One might wonder how it is possible to have a functioning society when it is so difficult for individuals to agree about fundamental beliefs. There is unquestionably a tension between my two core assumptions, which is why social groups sometimes break apart, and also why there never has been, and probably never will be, a unified global society. Nevertheless, People are obviously capable of living together in social groups for sustained periods, as the planet has been populated with them since human beings first appeared. For a society to hold together, there must be substantial overlap in how its members think about the good life, and they must respect each other when, inevitably, serious disagreements arise. These differences notwithstanding, it is possible within a social group to have considerable agreement about first principles, mainly because the members share a common culture, which includes a variety of beliefs about ultimate values. Most people have been socialized since birth to venerate their culture, which means being socialized to respect certain core principles. Culture is a kind of glue that helps hold individuals together inside a society. But culture alone is not enough. To stay intact, a society also must have political institutions that govern behavior within the group. It needs rules that stipulate how the group's members are expected to live together, as well as the means to enforce those rules. This commonly takes the form of a juridical system based on what has become known as the rule of law. Social groups also need political institutions to help them survive in the face of threats from other groups. These institutions must control the means of violence both to enforce the rules within the society and to protect it from external threats. With political institutions comes politics, which is crucial to daily life in any society. Politics is essentially about who gets to write the rules that govern the group. This responsibility matters greatly because the members of any society are certain to have some conflicting interests, as they will never completely agree about first principles. Given that basic fact of life, whichever faction writes and interprets the rules can do so in ways that serve its interests rather than its rivals, or reflect its vision of society rather than its rivals. Of course, power matters greatly in determining which faction wins this competition. The more resources an individual or faction possesses, the more likely it is to control the governing institutions. In short, in a world where reason takes you only so far, the balance of power usually decides who gets to write and enforce the rules. Given the absolute necessity of politics for the functioning of social groups, when I say that humans are naturally social beings, 
I am in effect saying they are also political beings. This obviously includes hunter-gatherers who are sometimes wrongly portrayed as operating alone in a Hobbesian world. In fact, they live together in small groups in which power, rules, and factions, that is, politics, were unavoidable. The political and social dimensions of the human condition go hand in hand. Questions about what constitutes the good life are axiomatically about political as well as social matters. Although I frequently use the term social group in this book, it is shorthand for what is effectively a socio-political group. Politics is vitally important in the relations between self-governing social groups. There are no higher political institutions, however, that can write and reliably enforce rules that might govern their behavior toward each other. The power to write rules, which matter so much inside a society, thus matters much less at the intergroup level. Still, power itself matters greatly in dealings among groups, because possessing superior power allows a group to get its way when it is at odds with another group. Above all else, it allows a group to fend off threats to its survival from other groups. Independent social groups thus compete with each other for power. Politics among groups is all about gaining relative power. Social groups have a propensity to expand because greater size usually augments their power relative to rival groups and thus enhances their prospects for survival. Groups can also be bent on expansion for other reasons. They might believe, for example, that they have found the true religion or political ideology and go on a crusade to export their prized blueprint to other societies. Groups mainly expand by conquering other groups, although occasionally groups with common interests join together voluntarily. Conquerors usually try either to dominate the vanquished group and rob it of its autonomy or else absorb it into its own society. Sometimes they try to wipe out the defeated group. There are limits as to how far any group can expand because the potential victims almost always have powerful incentives to resist and ensure their own survival. In sum, I begin with two simple assumptions about human nature. There are significant limits on our ability to reason about first principles, and we are social animals at our core. Taken together, these assumptions tell us three important facts about the world. First, it is populated with a great number of social groups, each with its own distinctive culture. There is no reason to think that situation will change in the near or distant future. In effect, the crucial universal traits of humankind lead us to a world distinguished by its particularism. Second, social groups have no choice but to build political institutions, which means politics and power are at the center of life within societies as well as among them. Third, Survival is of overriding importance for individuals as well as social groups. It runs like a red skein through human history. Before examining the main components of my argument in detail, I need to define some important concepts. Key Definitions Much of the subsequent discussion revolves around five basic concepts. Culture, groups, identity, political institutions, and society. At least two of them, culture and identity are difficult to define, mainly because they are so sweeping. Not surprisingly, those terms are employed in various ways in both the scholarly literature and public discourse. Thus, it is essential to explain as precisely as possible how I am using them. I should note that these concepts are closely linked and hard to disentangle. For example, one might argue that culture, identity, and society are all part of a seamless web. They certainly overlap. Still, I have tried to define each one carefully and show how they relate to each other in the hope that this will make my core arguments easier to understand. A society is a large group of people who interact with each other on a continual basis in organized and routine ways. The members of a society are interdependent, leading some people to use the words society and community interchangeably. All societies have their own discrete culture, and they usually occupy a particular piece of territory. Many are sovereign political entities, which means they largely control their own destiny. Some societies, however, are not sovereign but are part of a larger political order. Culture gives meaning to the patterns of relationships that are the essence of any society. Cultures exist only in the context of societies. In my vocabulary, culture is the set of shared practices and beliefs that are at a society's heart. Those practices include customs and rituals, dress, food, music, routines, symbols, and the language people speak. They also include the subtle gestures, mannerisms, and communications by which people interact and make their way through daily life. The French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu called these a habitus, 
A society's beliefs, on the other hand, consisting of its political and social values, views about morality and religion, and stories about its history, deal explicitly with first principles. They guide how a particular society decides what constitutes the good life. Culture also includes the civil institutions, like churches and soccer stadiums, that reflect those practices and beliefs. Culture gives every society distinct characteristics that separate it from other societies. Sometimes, however, particular features are shared across cultures, although there is never a complete overlap. The reason cultures are distinct is that peoples around the world have remarkably diverse life experiences and histories. The environment, in other words, heavily shapes human behavior. Yet people also have agency. They possess critical faculties with which to determine how best to lead their lives. But people in different societies often come to different conclusions about first principles, which is another reason for variation among cultures. None of this is to deny that cultures evolve and change, sometimes drastically. History marches on, constantly bringing new circumstances and new ideas to which different cultures respond in different ways. When Western elites talk about global society or human society, the implication is that there has been a profound leveling of cultural differences across the planet. While there is no question that the Industrial Revolution, globalization, and the worldwide influence of Britain and the United States have had something of a leveling effect over the past two centuries, they have not led to anything like the universal culture that is a prerequisite for a global society. The proliferation of McDonald's and Starbucks and the ability of so many of the world's elites to speak English hardly amount to cultural sameness. There is an abundance of distinct cultures in the world, and they underpin a wide variety of societies. Heterogeneity, not homogeneity, is the prevailing state of global culture. Thus, global society and human society are not useful terms. A group is a collection of individuals who regularly interact with each other, have a sense of comradeship, share many of the same ideas, and have a common purpose. Although a society obviously qualifies as a group, the concept is elastic enough to include all sorts of clusters of people. My focus, however, is on large social groups that have their own political institutions. As it is used in this book, group is synonymous with society. Identity is a profoundly social concept that involves a person's or group's sense of self. Who am I? Or who are we? Identity is largely defined in relation to the other. At the individual level, it involves how a person thinks about himself in relation to other individuals or groups. This can involve multiple identities, of course, because people can belong to multiple groups. My focus here is on how individuals within a society relate to each other. For sure, an individual's identity is deeply influenced by his society's culture because it provides a set of practices and beliefs that all members must relate to daily and encourages members to think of themselves as similar. Nevertheless, each member's identity will invariably be shaped by important differences with others. Individuals in any society have different abilities and preferences and can affiliate with a host of different groups, and these things influence how they think about themselves in relation to others. A person's identity is not defined simply. What about societies themselves? Any large group's sense of itself depends on how its practices and beliefs distinguish it from other societies. In other words, a society's culture and its identity are inextricably bound up with each other. In this book, I pay particular attention to nations, the dominant social group on the planet, and to the concept of national identity. An individual's identity in the modern world is heavily influenced, but not completely shaped, by her nation's culture. Finally, political institutions are the governing bodies that create rules to regulate daily life and maintain order. Though they operate at different levels, within any society, there must be an overarching political authority. No society could survive for long without effective political institutions. Of course, in pre-literate societies, customary practices and norms take the place of written rules and formal governing institutions. My focus in this book, however, is on more modern societies. Let me now turn to my key assumptions about human nature. The Limits of Reason and the Good Life Humans have the capability to reason or think critically, a faculty that distinguishes them from all other animals and has allowed them to dominate the planet. It has also allowed them to establish an impressive body of theories about how the world works. Yet there are significant limits on our ability to reason, which have important consequences for social and political life. 
One such limitation, our inability to agree about what constitutes the good life, sometimes leads individuals, as well as social groups, to hate and try to hurt others, which in turn causes the others to worry about their survival. It is important to distinguish between our preferences and the best strategies for achieving them. This difference is reflected in the following two questions. First, are our preferences rational and do those goals promote our survival or make some other kind of sense? Second, are we acting strategically to achieve our goals? These two kinds of rationality are sometimes referred to as substantive and instrumental rationality, respectively. My main concern is with substantive rationality, which is more important for understanding politics. Yet instrumental rationality also matters in my story because it is directly tied to the ability of governments to effectively perform social engineering. There is certainly no consensus on that issue. In terms of our preferences, the key questions are, what can reason tell us about the good life? What does it say about how we should behave and arrange our lives, how a society should be organized, and what rules should govern its members' conduct? What can our critical faculties tell us about the bedrock ethical, moral, and political questions that confront all individuals and societies? How do we distinguish between right and wrong? All of these questions deal with first principles, the essential guidance for how we think and act. To put the questions in more concrete terms, what does reason tell us about which religion, if any, provides the true guide to how we should lead our daily lives? Can we reason our way to the ideal political system? Can our critical faculties resolve debates about abortion, affirmative action, or capital punishment? Can they settle conflicts between individual rights, such as when one person's freedom of speech clashes with another's right to privacy? What does reason say about whether we should treat outsiders differently from members of our own society, or when it is permissible to make war on other countries? These are just a few of the many questions related to how society should be organized and how their members should behave. Because we are an intensely social species, we cannot avoid wrestling with such questions. We have little choice but to try to figure out how to live with each other and develop a shared sense of the common good, even if that process never leads to a lasting consensus. Leo Strauss exaggerated only slightly when he wrote, All political action has then in itself a directness toward knowledge of the good, of the good life, or of the good society. Sometimes people have little opportunity to express their views on pivotal questions, and sometimes they try to avoid dealing with them. But every society must address them in some fashion. Take, for example, the matter of devising a body of moral principles to guide individual behavior. No social group can function effectively without widespread agreement on what constitutes moral behavior. The rules that facilitate cooperation in any society are rooted in its moral code. Even Judge Richard Posner, one of the world's leading legal theorists and no fan of basing legal decisions on moral principles, acknowledges that morality is a pervasive feature of social life and is in the background of many legal principles. Reason rules the world. Many people believe there is an objective set of first principles that almost every individual can ascertain. In other words, reason gives humans the capacity to figure out, in broad outline, what constitutes the good life. If some of us have difficulty figuring this out on our own, we can engage with others to clarify our thinking. The assumption is that reason, because it privileges facts and logic, and is little influenced by cultural or social forces that might interfere with systematic thinking, leads nearly everyone toward the same truths. Faith in reason was especially pronounced during the Enlightenment, the era in European history from roughly 1650 to 1800, that is sometimes called the Age of Reason. Many European intellectuals at the time, horrified by the long religious wars that ensued from the Protestant Reformation, wanted to believe that religion was a fading force and that the growth of science and education would provide people with the tools to recognize the essential truths about the good life. The power of reason would triumph over faith and settle many of the great questions of the day that religion had been unable to answer. Objective truth about the good life was thought to be possible. The French philosopher Nicolas de Condorcet captured this optimistic outlook when he wrote in his 1794 book, Sketch for a Historical Picture of the Human Mind, that his object will be to show from reasoning and from facts that no bounds have been fixed to the improvement of the human faculties, that the perfectibility of man is absolutely indefinite, that the progress of this perfectibility has no other limit than the duration of the globe upon which nature has placed us. The British philosopher William Godwin, 
went so far as to argue in 1793 that man is perfectible and that our understanding of justice would eventually be so advanced that there will be no need for government. Most Enlightenment thinkers' claims were more modest, but almost all of them had faith in the ability of human reason to significantly improve the human condition. Confidence in the power of our critical faculties has weakened over the past two centuries. Although science made great strides during that period, there has been little progress in working out a coherent and universally accepted understanding of what represents the good life. Individuals continue to have different core values and varying notions of what is the best society, and these conflicting ideals are usually irreconcilable. The political philosopher Alastair McIntyre captured how little progress has been made in achieving agreement about first principles. The most striking feature of contemporary moral utterance is that so much of it is used to express disagreements, and that the most striking feature of the debates in which these disagreements are expressed is their interminable character. I do not mean by this just that such debates go on and on and on, although they do, but also that they apparently can find no terminus. There seems to be no rational way of securing moral agreement in our culture. Yet, many people, when pressed, still maintain there are universal principles and that they know what they are. The power of this belief in objective truth often surfaces when a person is accused of being a moral relativist, someone who believes there are no right or wrong answers to life's big questions. Most will deny it vehemently. Relativists are sometimes accused of being nihilists, which means they are willing to tolerate almost any form of behavior, and the evil of nihilism is one of the few moral standards that command nearly universal agreement. Yet different people will answer the same questions in different ways, and there is no mechanism for choosing among their responses. Often, the more specific the question, the more intractable the disagreements. It is impossible to determine which person has the correct answer, it is all a matter of personal preference or opinion. The smart fallback position for dodging the relativism charge is to maintain that there is an objective set of first principles and I know what they are, but I cannot persuade everyone else to recognize them. Those who disagree with me are simply wrong but refuse to admit it. This line of argument, which many people pursue either explicitly or implicitly, allows them to escape the charge of relativism. What does this viewpoint say about our collective ability to use reason to arrive at a universal or even widely shared understanding of the good life? It tells us that people who believe their critical faculties can help them find moral truth are deluding themselves. Reason alone cannot answer these foundational questions. Reason does not rule the world, and it has limited value in helping large numbers of individuals reach a consensus regarding their core preferences. How little we agree. To illustrate the limits of reason, consider what it tells us about religion, which is profoundly concerned with ethical and moral questions. There is no way our critical faculties can determine which of the world's many religions provides the best rule book for guiding individual conduct or whether atheism provides better guidance. We have no objective reason for choosing, for instance, Catholicism over Protestantism or vice versa. This explains in good part why Catholics and Protestants murdered each other in huge numbers during the Reformation. Other religions show the same diversity. Consider the divide between Shia and Sunni Muslims, or the divisions among conservative Orthodox Reform and ultra-Orthodox Jews. The historical record shows that religions have a powerful tendency to fragment over time. Certain members grow dissatisfied with existing interpretations of the original wisdom and break away. In Christianity, for instance, the first great schism occurred in 1054 when the Christian world broke into two parts, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. The second major break came in 1517 with the Reformation when Martin Luther promulgated his 95 theses criticizing the practices of the Catholic Church. This brought a division not simply between Catholics and Protestants, but the myriad churches in the Protestant world. Anglicans, Baptists, Calvinists, Evangelicals, Lutherans, Methodists, Puritans, Quakers, and others. In an important study of the Reformation and its consequences, the historian Brad Gregory explains that the Reformers' initial aim was to repair what they thought were important doctrinal flaws in Catholicism. Their intention was to think critically about first principles. Instead, Gregory writes, they unintentionally introduced multiple sources of unwanted disagreement and found that, doctrinal controversy was literally endless. This led not just to the proliferation of different Christian religions, 
but to the privatization of religion in Western liberal states, which in turn helped promote secularization. Thus, we are faced today with the proliferation of secular and religious truth claims, along with related practices, that constitute contemporary hyperpluralism. In short, the history of religion offers little support for the claim that our critical faculties can help us reach broad agreement on core principles. Some might think the American legal system is a domain where reason and deliberation lead to widespread agreement about right and wrong. Many Americans surely think that justice is ultimately based on a well-defined and well-established inventory of moral principles. Nothing could be further from the truth. Many of the main bodies of Anglo-Saxon legal theory reject the notion that the law is or should be based on universal moral principles. They include critical legal studies, law and economics, legal positivism, legal realism, and liberal legalism. Legal realists, for example, focus on how judges decide cases, especially those in which the existing laws are indeterminate. They believe judges have considerable leeway in adjudicating these so-called hard cases, and that their decisions are ultimately determined by judgments of fairness or consideration of commercial norms. Judges, in other words, are pragmatic. They pay careful attention to how their decisions will play out in the real world. This is not to deny that the judge's own moral code influences her decision, but that is much different from saying she bases the decision on universal moral principles. Law and economics is based on a similar logic. Proponents of this approach maintain that judges should decide hard cases largely on the basis of economic efficiency, not widely recognized moral principles. This is a utilitarian approach to the law that emphasizes doing what is best for as many people as possible. Of course, not all judges considering the same case would agree on a single outcome. Who is the ultimate decider matters in the law and economic story as much as in legal realism. There are certainly legal scholars who believe judges should rely on universal moral principles. Natural law theorists fit in this category. Probably the most famous proponent of this position is Ronald Dworkin, who asserts that adjudication is characteristically a matter of principle rather than policy even while acknowledging that this is a minority view. Anglo-American lawyers, he writes, have on the whole been skeptical about the possibility of a right answer in any genuinely hard case. They are skeptical for good reason. Lawyers and judges rarely agree about first principles or on how to apply them in difficult cases. For Dworkin, the root principle on which courts should base their decisions is that government must treat people as equals by which he means the government should actively work to promote equality by providing everyone with equal resources to compete, even if that means restricting liberty. This is a legitimate point of view, but it is not widely shared. The problem is that it is virtually impossible to come up with a moral code that everyone, or almost everyone, in the legal field accepts. Dworkin admits as much when he writes, any judge's opinion about the best interpretation will therefore be the consequence of beliefs other judges need not share. A judge may think he has found moral truth, but he is not likely to find many colleagues who agree with him. Most will side with Oliver Wendell Holmes's claim that absolute truth is a mirage. That judges disagree about right and wrong explains why conservatives and liberals engage in bitter political fights over Supreme Court appointments. People on both sides of the ideological divide understand that the court regularly gets important cases where the law is unclear and where the judge's opinions matter greatly. They do not want their ideological adversaries to dominate the court, so they try hard to block the other side's candidates. Senator Barack Obama's 2005 statement explaining his vote against John Roberts as Chief Justice reflects this thinking. The problem I face is that while adherence to legal precedent and rules of statutory or constitutional construction will dispose of 95% of the cases that come before a court, what matters on the Supreme Court is those 5% of cases that are truly difficult. In those cases, adherence to precedent and rules of construction and interpretation will only get you through the 25th mile of the marathon. That last mile can only be determined on the basis of one's deepest values, one's core concerns, one's broader perspectives on how the world works, and the depth and breadth of one's empathy. In those 5% of hard cases, the constitutional text will not be directly on point. The language of the statute will not be perfectly clear. Legal process alone will not lead you to a rule of decision. In those difficult cases, the critical ingredient is supplied by what is in the judge's heart. 
What do economists have to say about the good life? Most economists assume that individuals are capable of using their critical faculties to maximize their utility, but this assumption concerns instrumental, not substantive, rationality. On the latter score, which is what we care about here, economists rarely claim that reason can be employed to choose preferences or utilities. Instead, they assume individual preferences as givens and concentrate on finding the optimal strategy to achieve whatever preferences are on the table. Economics, as Irving Kristol once remarked, has many useful and important things to tell us, but it really has nothing to say about the larger features of a good society. Finally, a word is in order about how Leo Strauss thought about our ability to divine the good life, which he took to be the main purpose of political philosophy. The common view of Strauss, a highly influential political philosopher, is that he believed that the best and brightest in any society can discern a coherent body of natural laws and rights. These chosen few would use their superior intellect to discover eternal truths, which would help them govern wisely. This is not an accurate interpretation of Strauss's thinking. Probably the best evidence he did not think this way is that in all of his voluminous writings, he never set out what those purported moral truths are. This lacuna prompted C. Bradley Thompson and Yaron Brook to challenge Strauss's students to explicate and defend a systematic, secular, rationally demonstrable moral code as objectively true. Their challenge went unanswered. This missing body of absolute truths is unsurprising, however, because Strauss himself talks explicitly about our inability to acquire any genuine knowledge of what is intrinsically good or right. Political philosophy, for Strauss, is all about the pursuit of truth with no promise that anyone will ever discover it. He writes, Philosophy is essentially not possession of the truth, but quest for the truth. The distinctive tract of the philosopher is that he knows that he knows nothing, and that his insight into our ignorance concerning the most important things induces him to strive with all this power for knowledge. It may be that as regards the possible answers to these questions, the pros and cons will always be in more or less even balance, and therefore that philosophy will never go beyond the stage of discussion or disputation and will never reach the stage of decision. This is hardly an optimistic view of what our critical faculties can do, even with abundant intellectual horsepower. A close look at Strauss's writings suggests that he believes reason's strong suit is not discovering the truth, but calling into question existing moral codes and other widely held beliefs. He comments at one point that the more we cultivate reason, the more we cultivate nihilism, the less we are able to be loyal members of society. This belief in reason's deconstructive power helps explain why Strauss thinks political philosophers are a danger to their own society and also why he believes political philosophy reached a dead end with Nietzsche. In other words, even though political philosophy is deeply concerned with the noble pursuit of the good life, it is ultimately a self-destructive enterprise because it privileges reason. Why Truth is So Elusive It seems apparent from this evidence, which could easily be amplified, that there are significant limits to what reason can tell us about the good life. Why is this so? Why do people have such difficulty agreeing on first principles? There are two main causes. First, our critical faculties alone cannot provide a universal set of answers to the pivotal questions all of us must confront. And second, the factors other than reason that shape our preferences are often resistant to reason and may even be outside our conscious awareness. An individual's thinking about the good life is largely shaped by three factors. First and foremost is socialization. Starting at birth, our parents and the broader society bombard us with messages about right and wrong. The principles we are taught largely reflect our society's cultural norms. But because all societies have evolved in different circumstances, they have distinct cultures. The same is also true of families. This means that individuals vary markedly in their thinking about the good life, depending on the circumstances in which they are raised. The social psychologist Jonathan Haidt concludes, children somehow end up with a morality that is unique to their culture or group. The second factor that influences our moral thinking is the set of innate sentiments hardwired into each of us at birth. We are born with a discrete bundle of attitudes or passions that are driven by feelings that are largely independent of the software package that society programs into us over our lifetimes. We are not born as blank slates. All humans, in other words, have different inclinations toward life's big questions, even before their families and societies begin shaping how they think. 
These innate feelings are hard to measure. We have limited knowledge about how the human brain works. Nevertheless, we see evidence all around us of individuals who are raised in the same family and socialized in similar ways, yet have different personalities and widely dissimilar views about what constitutes the good life. This is not to deny the power of socialization, but if it were the sole driving force, there would be more homogeneity of thought inside families and societies. Reason is the final factor influencing an individual's core principles. It involves a mental process different from that of sentiment and socialization, both of which rely on intuition. With intuition, individuals make decisions without consciously working through the matter at hand. The person thinks she instinctively knows the correct position to take. Sometimes this position comes quickly as a visceral response to seeing or hearing about a situation. Other times, it is a matter of slowly realizing how one feels about an issue, perhaps after repeated exposure to it. Often, this realization comes with a sense of having always felt this way, but only now coming to acknowledge it consciously. Whether fast or slow, however, sentiment and socialization naturally push individuals to believe they are well-equipped to offer insights on a host of issues. Reason, however, operates fundamentally differently. Reasoning is a process by which humans make a concentrated effort to put aside their intuitions and employ facts and logic to analyze problems and make decisions. An individual employing reason tries to address problems in a systematic and disciplined way without letting his biases or emotions interfere with his thought process. Reasoning is a time-consuming mental activity because it rejects spontaneous responses and instead requires careful construction and evaluation of arguments. Of course, an individual can engage in deliberation, which is where he and others collectively employ their critical faculties to analyze a difficult issue. Reason is a more disciplined form of interference than intuition, and it often provides a more transparent way of answering questions than either sentiment or socialization. The effort to exclude emotions is often not successful. As Antonio Damasio makes clear, it is impossible to completely separate your critical faculties from your biases and emotions, which, he argues, actually help individuals make well-reasoned decisions. Despite its elevated ranking, Reason is the least important of the three ways we determine our preferences. It certainly is less important than socialization. The main reason socialization matters so much is that humans have a long childhood in which they are protected and nurtured by their families and the surrounding society, and meanwhile exposed to intense socialization. At the same time, they are only beginning to develop their critical faculties, so they are not equipped to think for themselves. By the time an individual reaches the point where his reasoning skills are well-developed, his family and society have already imposed an enormous value infusion on him. Moreover, that individual is born with innate sentiments that also strongly influence how he thinks about the world around him. All of this means that people have limited choice in formulating a moral code because so much of their thinking about right and wrong comes from inborn attitudes and socialization. Some social psychologists argue that reason has very little to do with the formation of an individual's views about the good life. What reason does best, they claim, is provide a rationale for opinions largely formed by our intuitions. This perspective is stated in its starkest form by the famous British philosopher David Hume, who maintained that the rules of morality are not conclusions of our reason. For him, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. There is a place for reasoning in Hume's story, but it comes after the moral code has been established, and its main job is to find clever ways to justify it. This is what instrumental rationality is all about. There is obviously little substantive rationality in Hume's account. Hume overstates the case. Reason has its limits, but it does more than simply help us rationalize deeply held beliefs. For instance, it tells us that survival is our paramount goal because we cannot pursue our other goals if we do not survive. And even if it has limited utility in determining what those other goals might be, it can still be useful. Reason can help arbitrate when different intuitions come into conflict. It can also help an individual adjust his first principles when they lead to foolish or destructive behavior. Situations of this sort are not unusual because occasionally a person's surroundings change and she finds that accustomed ways of thinking about her environment no longer make sense. Finally, there are exceptional individuals who are committed to examining their deepest convictions in coldly analytical ways. Reason can lead such people to new ways of thinking about the world, which others may then follow.
we do have agency. We are not mere prisoners of our sentiments and socialization. Of course, not everyone is committed to rigorous self-examination, but even if they were, there are no grounds for thinking that unfettered reason would lead to universal agreement on what constitutes the good life. Pure reason can take you only so far. One might argue that education, not just for society's elite, but for every citizen, is the solution to this problem. That was the view held by John Dewey, an early 20th century American philosopher, who believed that with the proper education, the average individual would rise to undreamed heights of social and political intelligence. Dewey was well aware that societies are beset with conflicting views on core political and social issues, but he thought democracy coupled with education could resolve these conflicting claims. He wrote, The method of democracy, in as far as it is that of organized intelligence, is to bring these conflicts out into the open where their special claims can be seen and appraised, where they can be discussed and judged. The more the respective claims are publicly and scientifically weighed, the more likely it is that the public interest will be disclosed and be made effective. The belief that more education will produce consensus about the public interest is intuitively attractive, but on close inspection, it falls apart. Because humans are social beings, they tend to form strong bonds with fellow group members. Their loyalty makes it difficult for them to challenge prevailing group wisdoms. The power of groupthink, strong but not absolute, means that most people are not inclined to step outside their social group and act autonomously. Even when they try to act like hard-headed rationalists, they tend to proceed from assumptions based on years of socialization. There is little reason to think that providing citizens with more education will help them reach broad agreement about the principles that should govern their lives together. In fact, the opposite is more likely. Some forms of education explicitly instruct students in a particular moral view. Madrasas run today by Islamic extremists, the Marxist universities of the former communist world, or the religiously based higher education offered at European and American universities before the 20th century endorsed official views of the moral life. In some cases, these represented or represent little more than indoctrination. These forms of education only reinforce existing differences among societies. Where education exposes people to a variety of perspectives, it typically pushes students to be tolerant, if not respectful, of opposing viewpoints. Education of the sort Dewey prescribes widens rather than narrows one's horizons. In most Western universities, for instance, most educators avoid telling students what to think about value-laden questions because they are not in the business of proselytizing. In essence, the more education people get, the more complicated the world appears and the more difficult it becomes to believe in, much less discover, timeless truths. Finally, Dewey's ideal of education invariably involves teaching students to think critically. This is why we refer to our capacity to reason as our critical faculties. Educators, at least good ones, teach their students to ask hard questions and challenge received wisdoms, including their own. It is no accident that the motto of Britain's Royal Society, which describes itself as the oldest scientific academy in continuous existence, has as its motto, take nobody's word for it. The result is that a high-quality education makes students exceptionally good at criticizing purported truths, but gives them little training to discover truth other than empirically verifiable fact. Education hones our ability to reason, but ultimately makes it more, not less, difficult to reach agreement on first principles. Where does this leave us? Rousseau said long ago, I would have wished to be in a country where the sovereign and the people could have only one and the same interest, so that all movements of the machine always tended only to the common happiness. Of course, he was wishing for a state of affairs that can never be, because no group of people can ever achieve that level of agreement on foundational questions. For better or worse, our critical faculties are incapable of leading us to universal truths or categorical laws. We live in a world where relativism is a fact of life, even if most of us do not think of ourselves as relativists. Our Social Essence How should we think about the relationship between individuals and their societies? One way, commonly identified with liberalism, is to privilege the individual by arguing that she comes before society, which is effectively an artificial construct that is voluntarily created by a collection of individuals. Individuals in their natural state, so the argument goes, are free agents who develop their identities largely on their own, 
They choose to form societies and governments for their mutual benefit, but the social groups they form are essentially aggregates of individuals and do not meaningfully shape their members' identities. They are equivalent to marriages of convenience. This is a mistaken view of human nature. Individuals are social beings from the beginning. The idea that anyone starts life in the state of nature as a socially disconnected individual and lives that way for any period of time is obviously wrong. We all begin life as helpless infants and remain highly dependent on others for at least the first ten years of our lives, during which the people around us deeply influence how we think about and deal with the world. It can be no other way. Our individualism, which is inextricably bound up with our ability to reason, takes at least a few years to develop. Even if we withdraw to a desolate island, we cannot escape the fact that others have already socialized us in profound ways. Think about Robinson Crusoe, who was shipwrecked and stranded alone on the island of despair for 28 years. His thinking and behavior on that island were heavily shaped by everything he learned growing up in York, England. Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe, said as much in later reflections on the book. Man is a creature so formed for society that it may not only be said that it is not good for him to be alone, but tis really impossible he should be alone. It also seems clear, as Defoe hints, that we like interacting with other people. The evidence is overwhelming that humans are psychologically disposed to want to be part of a society. Humans are hardwired to want frequent interactions with other humans, including people outside their immediate families. Hardly anyone moves to a remote area and cuts off all contact with the outside world. Even Ted Kaczynski, the infamous Unabomber, continued to interact with American society, albeit in limited and wicked ways. The Survival Imperative Survival is the foremost reason that humans naturally operate in groups larger than the family unit. For starters, individuals need sexual partners, not only to satisfy their desires, but also to help create and sustain families and the species more generally. The need to reproduce is common to all species, and for primates, that necessitates looking for sexual partners beyond one's immediate family. Of course, having children means that families not only grow in size, but also become connected with other families. This pattern facilitates the growth of social groups. Groups are also more efficient than individuals or single families at providing food and life's other necessities. The people who constitute any sizable group inevitably have a variety of skills and aptitudes which will allow them to create a division of labor. This kind of specialization and cooperation makes it easier to satisfy the basic needs of daily life and also facilitates greater prosperity. Furthermore, if a family is alone and runs into serious hardship, say the death of one or both parents, the children have nobody to turn to for help, but if they are embedded in a social group, they have a large support network that can step in and provide assistance. Finally, belonging to a group can help protect a person from someone or some group that might want to harm him, as there is strength in numbers. Large size, however, does not guarantee survival. A social group, then, is a survival vehicle. By cooperating with each other, members maximize their prospects of not only staying alive, but also remaining able to pursue their interests, including their interest in reproducing. Of course, there is no assurance they will survive inside a society, but their chances are generally much better within a group than if they go it alone. Even though there are particular situations in which individuals have a strong incentive to eschew cooperation and act selfishly, the imperative to cooperate more often than not trumps the urge to take advantage of others in the group. The Importance of Culture Every society has its own distinctive culture, with different practices and beliefs. Two societies might speak different languages, worship different gods, and have different moral codes, customs, and historical narratives. Society, Emile Durkheim writes, is not a mere sum of individuals. Rather, the system formed by their association represents a specific reality which has its own characteristics. This cultural variety, which militates against the formation of a global society, is due in good part to geography. The planet is huge, and the circumstances people face in its countless regions vary greatly, causing groups around the world to develop distinctive routines and ways of thinking. But the diversity also exists because people, using their critical faculties, reach different conclusions about what constitutes the good life. It is not just the environment that shapes culture. Individuals have agency. 
This simple fact of life makes it difficult, though not impossible, to build consensus within a social group. While it is sometimes possible to generate substantial agreement across different societies regarding their practices and beliefs, enough important differences almost always remain to keep those societies functioning as independent entities. This inability to make societies identical explains why the world has been, and always will be, populated by a vast array of social groups with unique cultures. Culture is enormously important in shaping how individuals think and behave, the social group that a person is born into is forever a part of his identity. As Antonio Gramsci put it, we are all the product of historical processes that have deposited in us an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. We have little choice regarding the culture in which we are reared and in which our identity is deeply bound up. The culture software that the society provides to an individual in those critically important formative years heavily influences how he thinks about himself and the world around him how he acts in his daily life. An individual can reject the culture she was born into, either by attempting to change it or by joining a different society. Transforming a society's culture not only is exceedingly difficult, cultures have deep roots, but doomed to only partial success. Even an individual who succeeds still cannot change the fact that she was shaped in large part by the culture she seeks to transform, and that even in defiance, she remains in many ways its prisoner. Similarly, someone who leaves an old life brings to his new life cultural baggage that will continue to shape his identity in important ways. Think about an immigrant coming to the United States. No matter how fervently he embraces American culture and rejects the values and traditions of the old country, his identity will always be heavily influenced by the culture of his youth. Hans Morgenthau and Leo Strauss, for example, left Europe as young men in the 1930s and came to the United States where they became major figures in American intellectual life. Yet their thinking about the world remained deeply influenced by German intellectuals, such as Martin Heidegger, Friedrich Nietzsche, Carl Schmitt, and Max Weber, whom they had read as students and fledgling scholars in Europe. Culture is important for another reason. It is the glue that helps hold a society together. Humans may be social animals, but the people who make up a society are individuals as well as community members. Despite all the socialization they undergo, they are capable of thinking for themselves, and often do. Sometimes they do not cooperate with others to solve important problems, but instead act in selfish and harmful ways. More importantly, as we have seen, people in any social group have difficulty reaching shared agreement about first principles. Centrifugal forces of varying intensity are at work in every society and are sometimes strong enough to make it violently fly apart. Culture plays an essential role in keeping those centrifugal forces at bay. First, within social groups there is usually considerable, though never complete, agreement about first principles because the members share similar daily lives and have a common history. Most of them, having been heavily socialized since birth to venerate their culture, will have a sense, to quote Edmund Burke, that their society is a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. Group members also tend to respect each other and develop powerful group loyalties that help them get along despite their differences. Members are likely to feel they are part of a common enterprise in which people work together for the good of the collective. Most members strongly identify the group's survival with their own, giving them a powerful incentive to cooperate and to agree to disagree even on major issues. Yet there are limits to what culture can do to hold a society together. Sometimes, a single issue exposes such deep divisions that it threatens to tear the society apart. Think about the slavery issue in the United States before the Civil War. Sometimes radically new circumstances undermine a society's key practices and beliefs, revealing deep disagreements among the members as they attempt to reformulate their views on what constitutes the good life. Think about Germany after its devastating defeat in World War I. Sometimes unanticipated stresses are so great that the society loses coherence. Think of Chinese society after European colonization during the 19th century. When substantial numbers of people in a society reject important aspects of their culture or act selfishly because they believe they are no longer part of a common enterprise, it is difficult for the community to survive unless those dissatisfied persons are either mollified or made to leave. In brief, individuals may naturally operate within social groups but their level of commitment to the collectivity can vary enormously.
attachment obviously promotes group solidarity, while disillusionment, if sufficiently widespread, leads to the demise of the group and the birth of new ones in its place. That centrifugal forces are at play in every society and occasionally lead to its unraveling tells us that culture alone is not enough to hold a society together. There are three other ways to keep a society intact. One is to create a foreign boogeyman sufficiently fearful to motivate the society's members to work together to defend against the threat. Another is to unify a majority by defining a treacherous other within the society itself. But the most important way societies prevent disintegration is by building formidable political institutions for which there is no substitute. Political Institutions and Power Societies need political institutions in order to deal with other groups and to help their members live together peacefully and productively. Within the group, individuals constantly interact with each other and sometimes compete over matters like resources and money. They engage in sharp disputes about broader societal goals and how best to achieve them. Thus, those individuals, as well as the factions and social organizations they form, need rules that define acceptable and unacceptable conduct and also dictate how disputes will be settled. Social groups also need mechanisms to interpret and enforce these rules. They need a way to adjudicate disputes and punish rule breakers. In some cases, they have to prevent or stop violence among their members. They need some person or body responsible for organizing and administering daily life to ensure that no member endangers other members' survival. Simply put, they need authorities. Social groups have a powerful incentive to move beyond anarchy and create hierarchy. Societies also need political institutions for another reason, to help shield them from other social groups that might have an incentive to attack and maybe destroy them. In this, their aim is not to transcend anarchy, but to determine how best to survive in a world where a group that gets into trouble has no higher authority to turn to. Such a group will need some sort of military force to maximize its prospects for survival. All of this is to say the society's political institutions should control the means of violence, not only to enforce the rules at home, but also to protect against foreign enemies. Those institutions will have to deal with the outside world on more mundane matters as well, because survival, while vitally important, is not a group's only concern. To this point, I have portrayed political institutions as largely neutral instruments that favor no individual or faction over others, suggesting that there are no politics in my story. In fact, political institutions are not impartial bodies. The rules that govern social groups reflect a particular vision of the good life and invariably favor some individuals' or factions' interests more than others. Therefore, it matters greatly who writes, interprets, and enforces the rules because whoever does these things can shape daily life in ways that reflect her interests and views about the good life. There will almost always be fierce competition within any social group to determine who controls its political institutions. Politics is a staple of everyday life in any society. At its deepest level, politics is a conflict over first principles, which is not to deny its more mundane side. Political competition revolves around conflicting visions of how society should be organized or how the individuals and factions within it should interact with each other. This competition is usually intense, and sometimes it involves chicanery, coercion, and violence. As former President Bill Clinton once remarked, politics is a contact sport that inevitably produces winners and losers, although their positions are not guaranteed to be permanent. At a more practical level, Politics in any society is all about competing for control of the governing institutions. Here is where power, which is based on resources like money, social capital, and access to media, matters. The more powerful a person or faction, the more likely it is to prevail in the political arena, which will then allow it to shape the society's political institutions in ways that enhance its own interests and power. In other words, the mighty get to determine, in Harold Laswell's famous words, who gets what when, how. Winners are not prevented from pursuing policies that benefit almost everyone in the group, although how much each person profits is another matter. The institutions that govern any society are not simply fair-minded arbiters or night watchmen. They are political actors at their core. Politics among social groups. The interactions among social groups are also political. While the balance of power matters in intergroup relations as well as in intragroup relations, 
there is an important difference between the two realms. Within a society, who writes and interprets the rules matters greatly, but rules do not matter nearly as much as interactions among social groups because there is no superior authority to enforce them. Social groups operate in an anarchic setting. More importantly, there is no higher authority policing intergroup behavior to make sure one group does not threaten another group's survival. This is not to say survival is guaranteed inside a society, because it is not. But within a group, there are political institutions with substantial coercive power that can protect the group's members. The importance of power in anarchy is not that it determines who writes the rules, because rules do not matter much in intergroup relations, but that it is the best means for societies to protect themselves against violent threats from another society. They want abundant material resources, especially military ones, to maximize their prospects of survival in the face of existential threats. In the absence of a higher political authority, fear is a powerful motivator. Social groups also want power because it allows them to pursue other goals as well. They understand Thucydides' maxim. In an anarchic system, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. No society can ever be too powerful relative to its competitors. The Imperative to Expand Social groups are strongly inclined to grow at the expense of other groups. Not every society has the ability to expand, but the incentive is ever-present. There are several possible motives for enlargement, one of which is ideology. The leaders of a society may think they have discovered the true religion or the ideal political system and want to export it to other societies because they think it would benefit humankind. A more likely impulse, however, is economic. A group might want to seize another group's land or raw materials or simply incorporate the other group's economy into its own so as to make itself larger and wealthier. But the main reason societies seek to expand is survival. Because groups can have different interests and profound disagreements about core principles, there is always the possibility one group will threaten another group's survival. That threat can take different forms. One group might try to kill everyone in a rival group, or it may leave the target society intact but deny it autonomy. The aggressor controls the resources of the conquered group and heavily influences its politics or even enslaves it. Finally, the target society may simply be absorbed into the victor society. All of these outcomes are disastrous for any society, and fear of them leads societies to fear each other and to worry about their survival. One of the best ways for a society to increase its survival prospects is to become more powerful. The best insurance is to be much more powerful than all the others. The strong do not always defeat the weak, but they do more often than not. Thus, for purposes of maximizing security, social groups have a strong incentive to incorporate or dominate, even eradicate, other groups. Doing so not only makes a society more powerful, but also eliminates potential rivals. It should be clear from this discussion that it is difficult to separate the economic and survival motives because wealth is one of the key prerequisites of military power. The discussion so far has emphasized expansion at the end of a rifle barrel, but there is another way for a group to expand. It can form a social contract with a like-minded group. It is possible, although highly unlikely, that two societies would voluntarily join together because they have similar cultures, agree in good part on core values, and have few conflicting interests. A union might promise greater prosperity for both societies. Egypt and Syria coming together to form the United Arab Republic in 1958 is an example of this kind of union, but unsurprisingly, the new country fell apart after only three years. It is also possible, although extremely unlikely, that two social groups might think about the good life in different ways, but one is able to convince the other to accept its way of thinking and join together to form a larger whole. The most likely reason for two societies to merge is a common threat that makes unification into a more powerful entity seem like a good bet to increase their prospects of survival. These voluntary associations are hard to engineer. Social groups rarely give up their independence to become part of a larger whole. Expansion is almost always the result of one society coercing or conquering another. Societies tend to have markedly different cultures that generally entail fundamental differences over first principles, making it hard for any group to persuade another to abandon its way of life and accept a new set of practices and beliefs. Any society bent on expanding its borders will, in all likelihood, have to do it by force.
Yet, there are limits to what can be achieved by force. Coercion and conquest sometimes works well, but certainly not all of the time. One problem an expansionist group faces is that the target is likely to resist its advances, often with fanatical zeal. Even if the attacking forces defeat an opponent, the victim still might find subtle and sophisticated ways to resist integration. Moreover, as a society grows, its potential for disintegration increases simply because a greater population brings a greater possibility of profound differences about what constitutes the good life. The more different the cultures that are merged, the more severe these value differences are likely to be. Furthermore, even if a society conquers and absorbs many other groups, it still faces significant limits on additional enlargement. One problem is that there is an abundance of groups on the planet and few of the remaining ones would go down without a fight. And because those groups are spread out around the globe, any group bent on dominating all the others will find that distance makes it harder and harder to project power, a problem that is made worse by large bodies of water, mountain ranges, and deserts. Any society can expand only so far before the law of diminishing return sets in. These barriers to expansion go a long way toward explaining why there is no global society, and thus, why the international system is anarchic. Survival and the Human Condition My bottom line is straightforward. Our critical faculties cannot provide definitive answers to questions regarding the good life, and so, there will always be serious disagreements about these issues, which matter greatly to both individuals and societies. These differences sometimes lead to such a deep hostility that one or both parties are moved to act aggressively. The fact that many people believe universal truth exists and that they have found it only makes the situation worse, as thinking in terms of absolutes makes it hard to promote compromise and tolerance. If almost everyone were a self-acknowledged moral relativist, it would foster a live-and-let-live zeitgeist that would help make the world a more peaceful place. But people are not like that and the fact that those who disagree with you may be inclined to kill you means that individuals as well as societies will fear each other and worry about their survival. Fortunately, human social groups are configured to address the twin problems of fear and survival. The prevailing culture in any society contains a package of practices and beliefs to which members are introduced when they are young and which they hear about for the rest of their lives. Most of these principles are accepted by most members most of the time, which has the effect of reducing but not eliminating conflict over them. Culture works like glue. It is essential to a society's cohesion, but it is not sufficient by itself. Societies also construct political institutions that write rules and maintain order, which foster some tolerance and helps prevent their members from killing each other when they clash over important issues. Yet the potential for conflict never goes away completely. Simply put, the fact that we live in a world populated by social beings with impressive but limited critical faculties is the taproot of human conflict. To be crystal clear, I am not arguing that individuals are naturally bad or evil. The political philosopher Carl Schmitt maintained that ultimately every theory of politics revolves around the assumption that humans are either essentially good or essentially bad, and some famous thinkers did in fact base their theories on such assumptions. Rousseau, for example, argued that humans are essentially good in their natural condition but are corrupted by society. Reinhold Niebuhr, on the other hand, believed that humans are born with original sin, which means they are primed to misbehave in various ways for the rest of their lives. One problem with Schmidt's perspective is that good and bad are vague concepts whose meaning is hard to pin down. To the extent that we can wrap our heads around them, surely everyone has some of both traits. Anyway, if one does employ this distinction, what explains why people are naturally good or bad? Attributing it to original sin or something similar does not provide an explanation that we can evaluate through any sort of evidence. I am also not arguing that humans are naturally aggressive, as some sociobiologists claim, or that they possess an animus dominandi, as Hans Morgenthau famously asserted. For sure, some people fit this model, but there are also many who do not. The human species is a variegated lot. We are not all type A personalities. Moreover, one could argue that natural selection leads first and foremost to cooperation, not aggression. Individuals have powerful incentives to cooperate with others, especially fellow members of their group, to maximize their survival prospects. 
Of course, humans sometimes behave aggressively, and the propensity for aggression certainly varies from one person to the next. But in my story, it is often because they have fundamental disagreements about first principles, not because aggression is a hardwired first reaction to any given situation. They may also act aggressively because their environment encourages them to do so. For example, they may be members of a social group operating in an anarchic system that is bent on expanding to maximize its chances of survival. The same individuals might be much less aggressive in a hierarchic system. The great isms of liberalism, realism, and nationalism do not operate in a state of mathematical abstraction. They work the way they do because humanity is the way it is. When we turn to examine liberalism, which I will do in the next chapter, it will be in light of the ideas about human nature and politics that I have just outlined. 3. Political Liberalism We can think of political liberalism as coming in two variants, modus vivendi liberalism and progressive liberalism. They share a common view of human nature, which emphasizes individualism as well as the limits of our critical faculties to discover collective truths about the good life. Both stress the importance of inalienable rights, rights that cannot be taken away or voluntarily given up, tolerance, and the need for a state to maintain public order. There are two key differences between modus vivendi and progressive liberals. They think differently about the content of individual rights and about the role of the state. For modus vivendi liberals, rights are all about individual freedom to act without government interference. Freedom of the press and the right to own property are two examples. Progressive liberals also prize individual freedoms, but they also believe in rights that call for the government to help its citizens. They think all individuals have a right to equal opportunity, which requires social engineering by the state to ensure that right is realized. Modus vivendi liberals do not recognize that right and are generally skeptical about the benefits of social engineering. They tend to have a minimalist view of how much the state should interfere in the daily lives of its citizens, while progressive liberals favor a more activist government. One might think that modus vivendi and progressive liberals fundamentally disagree about the power of our critical faculties to determine first principles. Progressives tend to emphasize that reason facilitates extreme tolerance in liberal societies and can even help us move toward universal consensus on moral matters. Modus vivendi liberals clearly reject those claims and instead emphasize reason's limits. And while they recognize the importance of tolerance, they are more inclined than progressive liberals to see its limits too. But closer inspection reveals no meaningful difference between the two strains of liberalism on these matters. Progressive liberals cannot back up their optimistic claims for what reason can tell us about the good life, and they ultimately end up sounding like modus vivendi liberals. Concerning our ability to reason, progressive and modus vivendi liberals think differently about the effectiveness of social engineering, which involves using one's critical faculties for instrumental purposes, not for determining ultimate goals. Progressive liberals have more faith in instrumental rationality than do modus vivendi liberals. Thus, the taproot of progressivism is not reason in the service of determining first principles or promoting tolerance, but as an expansive view of individual rights coupled with a belief in the state's ability to do social engineering. A glance at how contemporary liberal societies are organized makes it clear that progressive liberalism has triumphed over modus vivendi liberalism. This is not to deny that liberal democracies contain a substantial number of modus vivendi liberals or argue that progressive liberalism is intellectually superior. But progressive liberalism has won the day in real-world influence. Contemporary liberal societies cannot be organized along the lines prescribed by modus vivendi liberalism because the structural forces that buffet modern states demand the kind of interventionist policies that are at the core of progressive liberalism. Political leaders operate in a world that is too complicated for modus vivendi liberalism's laissez-faire approach to governing. Because there is today no substitute for an interventionist state, political liberalism is now synonymous with progressive liberalism. The best starting point for examining political liberalism is to define the features that modus vivendi and progressive liberalism have in common. This is liberalism's hard core. Next, I will analyze both variants of political liberalism emphasizing their differences, and then explain why progressive liberalism is now the dominant form. Finally, I will briefly examine a pair of theories, utilitarianism and liberal idealism, that are sometimes labeled liberal but are not, even if one of them has the word liberal in its name, 
because they do not share political liberalism's emphasis on natural rights. They operate according to fundamentally different logics than either modus vivendi or progressive liberalism. Utilitarianism and liberal idealism may be important theories, but they are not liberal theories, and so they fall outside the scope of this book. Political Liberalism The liberal story begins with atomized individuals in the state of nature, where they are said to have a common set of traits. In this state of perfect freedom, they are all endowed with a set of inalienable rights and they are all equals. John Locke, one of liberalism's founders, describes the state of nature as a state also of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than that creatures of the same species and rank, promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same facilities, should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection. This emphasis on individualism represented a radical break with the writings of pre-modern political philosophers such as Aristotle, Aquinas, Augustine, Machiavelli, and Plato, all of whom assumed that humans are naturally political or social beings. As Alexis de Tocqueville put it, our ancestors had no word for individualism, a word we have coined for our own use because, in their time, there was no individual who did not belong to a group or who could consider himself to be entirely alone. Nor did these ancestors think that all individuals should be seen as equals. They thought that some men are born with superior talents and thus deserve to rule the less capable. Political liberalism's second foundational assumption concerns our ability to reason. There is no question humans possess impressive critical faculties, but, as we have seen, their ability to reason has only limited use for determining what constitutes the good life. Reason alone does not dictate how people think about life's big questions, but is subordinate to sentiments and socialization. Even when individuals deliberately set out to make well-reasoned judgments about first principles or make moral deductions from those principles, there are at least some disagreements, say for the universal agreement among liberals, that all individuals are naturally bestowed with a set of rights. When individuals differ over first principles, they sometimes end up hating and trying to harm each other. This basic logic is laid out in the writings of Thomas Hobbes, who, though he was not a liberal theorist, articulated some of the seminal ideas underpinning liberalism. At first glance, Locke appears to take a different view. He begins his second treatise by extolling the virtues of reason, making it seem like the state of nature, unlike the one depicted in Hobbes's Leviathan, an idyllic place. Locke quickly changes his story, however, and ends up portraying the state of nature as rather nasty and brutish, in good part because of the variety of opinions and contrariety of interest which unavoidably happen in all collections of men. The threat of conflict sits at the heart of political liberalism. The key question is what can be done to ameliorate that danger. The Liberal Formula for Maintaining Order Political liberals have a three-pronged strategy for dealing with the possibility of deadly conflict. First, they emphasize that every one set of inalienable rights includes the right to life, which means not only the right to survive, but also the freedom to live the good life as one sees fit. People have the right to choose whatever lifestyle they want, as long as it does not infringe on the rights of others. This specifically includes freedom of conscience, the right to live according to one's religious beliefs. Rights are designed to maximize the amount of freedom individuals have in their daily lives. The most famous sentence in America's Declaration of Independence succinctly captures this first prong of political liberalism. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The second prong in the strategy is to purvey the norm of toleration. If individuals have the right to pursue their own way of life, others have an affirmative duty to recognize this right. The norm of toleration tells us that we should accept that others will sometimes disagree with us about core principles, and that even if we intensely dislike or despise what others think or say, we may not punish or kill them for their views. Instead, everyone will adopt a live-and-let-live -live approach to life, resolve their conflicts peacefully, and maintain a healthy respect for the law. At best, Individuals might come to respect opposing viewpoints about the good life and think that fundamental differences make for a healthy society. We come together, one might argue, by accepting our differences. But it is imperative that people at least tolerate those with whom they have profound disagreements. 
But tolerance has its limits. Some people feel so passionately about particular aspects of the good life that they cannot abide disagreement. They find it impossible to believe that other world views can be held in good faith. The people who hold these views, they imagine, must be deliberately turning away from the truth and are perhaps evil. This intolerant mindset makes them a threat, not just to their antagonists, but to liberal society itself. The fact that not everyone will be committed to value pluralism brings us to the third prong in the liberal strategy, a strong state that sits above society and maintains order. The state is well suited for this task because, as Max Weber famously said, it holds a monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. The state, to maintain order, assumes three principal roles. Most importantly, it acts as a night watchman that protects individual rights and prevents mortal combat between people or factions with conflicting views. Liberalism, to borrow Thomas Carlyle's phrase, is anarchy plus a constable. The state also writes the rules that define acceptable and unacceptable conduct while going to great lengths not to trample on individual rights. These rules allow individuals or groups to interact in civil ways as each pursues its own version of the good life. Finally, the state acts as an arbiter when serious disputes arise to ensure that conflicts do not lead to violence. The state, in other words, functions as a rulemaker, umpire, and night watchman. The liberal state obviously performs more functions than those aimed at keeping domestic order. Progressive liberals want the state to promote equal opportunity for its citizens and engage in other forms of social engineering as well. Modus vivendi liberals would surely object, but even they mostly agree that the state has to manage its economy and conduct foreign policy. A host of other matters, such as education, social security, housing, and labor relations, also require the attention of even a laissez-faire government if it hopes to avoid economic depression, chaos, and unrest. In short, modern liberalism cannot work without a strong state. Still, political liberals of all persuasions have mixed views about the state's role, although they know the state is essential for preserving order and allowing civil society to flourish. They also recognize its powerful potential to trample on individual rights. As the political theorist Judith Schlar put it in an important essay on liberalism, the fear and favor that have always inhibited freedom are overwhelmingly generated by governments, both formal and informal. And while the sources of social oppression are indeed numerous, none has the deadly effect of those who, as agents of the modern state, have unique resources of physical might and persuasion at their disposal. Nevertheless, as the quintessential liberal Thomas Paine wrote, government is, in the final analysis, a necessary evil. Liberals thus look for ways to limit the state's power. For example, liberal states can set up a political order built around checks and balances, or they can adopt federalism, where the central government delegates substantial power to regional authorities. Because liberal countries are invariably democracies, there is always the risk that the majority will tyrannize the minority. One way to minimize this danger is to write a clearly articulated Bill of Rights into the Constitution. It is important to emphasize that, outside of its night watchman function, a liberal state seeks to stay out of the business of telling people what kind of behavior is morally correct or incorrect. It encourages, and sometimes requires, toleration and works to ensure the prosperity and security of its citizens. The central aim, however, is to allow people, as much as possible, to live according to their own principles. Liberalism is distinct from republicanism, which emphasizes an individual's duties and obligations and favors a state that actively promotes civic virtue. It is also fundamentally at odds with Aristotle's view that the end of politics is to produce citizens of a certain sort, that is, good people and doers of noble actions. A purely liberal state is soulless. It creates few emotional bonds between citizens and their government, which is why it is sometimes said that getting people to fight and die for a liberal state is especially difficult. It should be apparent by now that the liberal story envisions a distinct boundary between the state and civil society. The state is the product of a social contract drawn up by a large body of individuals who go to considerable lengths to make sure the government they create does not interfere too much in their lives. The goal is to limit the amount of what Herbert Spencer called ministerial overseeing, so as to maximize people's freedom to lead their own version of the good life. Modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals disagree on what is the appropriate amount of ministerial oversight. Liberalism also seeks to minimize the importance of politics as much as possible. As I noted earlier, 
Politics, at its most basic level, is about conflicts over fundamental questions regarding the good life. This is what makes it an adversarial enterprise. Liberalism tries to ameliorate political conflict by giving individuals abundant freedom to live their lives as they see fit, thus removing at least part of the reason for fighting over first principles. As Marcus Fisher notes, liberalism has pacified political life by emptying it of much of its meaning. Or, as Stephen Holmes puts it, Liberalism seeks to remove from the public agenda issues that are impossible to resolve by either argument or compromise. Yet, even as they try to attenuate politics, liberals acknowledge the importance of allowing individuals to freely engage in economic activity. Their ultimate aim is to create a world where economics overshadows politics. This line of thinking, clearly reflected in the writings of John Locke, was pushed forward in its most comprehensive form by Adam Smith, he argues for doing as much as possible to keep the government from interfering in the economy so that individuals can pursue their own self-interest, which, he claims, will ultimately work to the benefit of the entire society. The invisible hand, he maintains, will guide the market to create increasing abundance, whereas the state, if it tried to guide the economy, would be more of a hindrance than a help. It is no exaggeration to say that capitalism and liberalism go hand in hand. Liberals understand that there will always be serious political disputes between individuals and between factions. Those quarrels, however, are settled by the state, which writes the rules and enforces them. The state is the ultimate arbiter in a process built around peaceful conflict resolution. Predictably, political liberalism places much emphasis on courts and the rule of law, since it aims to deal with political problems in the legal system, not the political arena. John Gray captures this point in his assessment of John Rawls's thinking. The central institution of Rawls's political liberalism is not a deliberative assembly, such as a parliament. It is a court of law. All fundamental questions are removed from political deliberation in order to be adjudicated by a supreme court. The self-description of Rawlsian doctrine as political liberalism is supremely ironic. In fact, Rawls's doctrine is a species of anti-political legalism. There are limits, however, on the ability of liberal states to minimize politics. The most important limit is that the state is unable to be neutral, mainly because it writes the rules that govern much of daily life, and many of those rules deal with first principles. Given the inevitable sharp differences over what constitutes the good life, it matters enormously which faction in a society gets to write the rules. This means there will be marked competition to win high office. This competition is likely to be especially intense in liberal states because they are also democracies, which carries at least the theoretical possibility of a transfer of power through an election. Authoritarian states actually have less room for politics because iron control from the top either stamps out or limits public competition for office. In short, politics is guaranteed to be a part of daily life in liberal states, simply because there is no way of completely eliminating deep disagreements over first principles. The liberal formula for separating the state from civil society and trying to reduce the influence of politics marks a fundamental break with previous thinking about the optimum political order. In the writings of ancient philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato, political institutions and civil society were woven closely together. Actively participating in politics was a necessary element of a good life. Engaging in the public sphere was considered a noble enterprise, and thus, it was a mark of distinction to be a prominent public figure. Even Machiavelli, who emphasized the harsh and cruel side of politics in The Prince, saw the state and civil society as a seamless web. He stressed that clever political strategies could serve the pursuit of noble political goals, especially republicanism. Liberalism offers a much different way of thinking about politics and the good life. Liberalism's Paradoxes Two paradoxes embedded in liberalism merit discussion before we examine the differences between modus vivendi and progressive liberalism. The first paradox concerns tolerance. In any liberal society, some people will reject liberalism and would overturn the political order if given the opportunity. If a substantial number of people held this view, they would surely present a mortal threat to liberalism. It would make little sense in these circumstances for liberals to practice toleration toward their enemies, since a live-and-let-live live approach could destroy the regime. Liberals, of course, are aware of this danger, which means liberalism has a sense of vulnerability at its core that naturally provokes a tendency toward intolerance among liberals. This logic explains in good part 
why Locke, who wrote a famous essay on the virtues of toleration, was intolerant in his writings toward atheists and Catholics. He believed Catholics could not be trusted because of their allegiance to the Pope and their own intolerance, and that atheists could not be trusted because their pledges were not backed up by divine sanction. Both groups were thus, in his mind, a threat to liberalism. In practice, the level of threat varies, and this intolerance is usually kept at bay. Liberalism tends toward intolerance for another reason as well. Most liberals consider liberalism superior to other kinds of political order and believe the world would be a better place if it were populated solely by liberal regimes. There is a sense of both vulnerability and superiority wired into liberalism that fosters intolerance despite the theory's emphasis on purveying tolerance to maintain domestic harmony. There is another seeming contradiction at liberalism's core. The theory contains both a particularist and universalist strand, which stand in marked contrast to each other. The universalist strand springs from liberalism's deep-seated commitment to individual rights. There are no boundaries or borders when it comes to human rights. They apply to every person on the planet. To be clear, the claim is not that individuals should have those rights, but that all people axiomatically do have them. There are no meaningful limits to our ability to reason when it comes to comprehending rights, one might say this is the pacific dimension of liberalism because respect for the rights of others should promote tolerance and discourage violent behavior. The particularist strand, on the other hand, stems from the liberal belief that it is impossible to get unanimous agreement on what constitutes the good life. Here we see the limits of reason at play. Some people will agree some of the time, but not all of them all of the time, and their disagreements will sometimes be so passionate that they are motivated to harm each other. One might call this liberalism's conflictual dimension, which underpins the need for the state to function as night watchman. Political liberalism thus has a universalist strand that emphasizes the power of reason, inalienable rights, and nonviolence, as well as a particularist strand that stresses the limits of reason, disagreements about first principles, and the fractious nature of politics. How do these opposing components of liberalism relate to each other, and which one is dominant? The overall theory seems to privilege the particularist strand, but this does not mean the universalist strand is of little consequence. The reason is straightforward. If liberalism's story about rights were truly compelling, there would be no need for a strong state to maintain order. A pervasive respect for individual rights would guarantee toleration and largely eliminate the need for a higher authority to prevent murder and mayhem. But virtually every liberal theorist recognizes the limits of tolerance and thus the need for a state to keep the peace. Passionate and politically deadly disputes over what defines the good life will always be with us. Tolerance by itself is not enough, which is another way of saying the particularist strand ultimately has more explanatory power in the liberal story than the universalist one. Modus vivendi liberalism The main arguments put forth by both modus vivendi and progressive liberals are fully consistent with the above description of political liberalism. The aim in this section and the next one is to examine the fine points of each variant and show how they differ. A number of political theorists who qualify as modus vivendi liberals would not necessarily agree with every detail of the composite picture I'm about to sketch. John Locke is a quintessential modus vivendi liberal, as are Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek. Two contemporary political theorists who fit this category are John Gray and Stephen Holmes. Many other liberal theorists make arguments that fit squarely with modus vivendi liberalism but promote other ideas that are at odds with it. These people, John Stuart Mill is one, are hard to put in the modus vivendi camp. Where appropriate, I will draw on the writings of these modus vivendi liberals to illustrate my main points. Modus vivendi liberals are deeply pessimistic about our ability to reach agreement on core principles. Rational inquiry, Gray writes, shows that the good life comes in many varieties, Reason can enlighten us as to our ethical conflicts. Often, it shows them to be deeper than we thought and leaves us in the lurch as to how to resolve them. This pessimism is magnified by the fact that individuals often make decisions without the aid of reason. As Holmes notes, all classical liberals were perfectly aware that most human behavior is non-calculating, habitual, and emotional, and that most human goals are non-material. Reason, it seems, does not point us to any objective truth about what political order is best. Modus vivendi liberals believe the essential function of rights is to give individuals maximum personal freedom to pursue their own interests. 
their emphasis is almost exclusively on negative rights, those that protect individuals from being constrained by others, including the government. They pay great attention to the right to own and exchange property, an emphasis that helps explain why liberalism is closely tied to capitalism. Finally, although modus vivendi liberals believe that all individuals are equal, they do not believe that this equality requires the government to level the playing field for its citizens. Tolerance is obviously central for modus vivendi liberals. Although they advocate a live-and-let-live approach to daily life, coexistence has its limits. They believe in the importance of a strong state that can maintain order, but beyond that they would, as much as possible, prevent the state from interfering in civil society. This perspective is hardly surprising, since modus vivendi liberals oppose state efforts to foster equality of opportunity, which would entail significant government action. Creating equal opportunity would involve redistributing resources, which would surely have adverse consequences for private property and also impinge on personal freedom. More generally, modus vivendi liberals do not like the idea of the state interfering in society to promote any kind of individual rights. Instead, the paramount goal should be simply to protect rights that might be threatened. Nor do they believe the state should try to manage the economy unless absolutely necessary. The preference instead is to build an economy based on unrestricted competition in open markets. The pessimism of modus vivendi liberals about our critical faculties goes beyond simply saying we cannot agree on first principles. They also tend to think the state cannot act intelligently to achieve ambitious goals. Governments, they argue, do not make meaningful progress. They hinder it. In essence, Modus vivendi liberals question whether states are instrumentally rational, which predisposes them to believe that almost all forms of government-directed social engineering are likely to fail. There is no place for an expansive welfare state in modus vivendi liberalism. Ultimately, modus vivendi liberalism is not an optimistic or progressive theory of politics. The state is supposed to take a laissez-faire approach to governing. Its goal should be simply to keep disagreements from turning deadly and to allow people as much freedom as possible to live as they see fit. Progressive Liberalism Progressive liberals tell a more hopeful story about political life. One might think from reading some of their works that this is because they are more sanguine about the capacity of human reason to answer critical questions regarding the good life. Some even appear to say that we can discover absolute truths. Others suggest that reason promotes deep tolerance among citizens in a liberal society, thus largely removing the threat of violence. But on close inspection, these claims do not hold up, and the progressive liberals who make them invariably backtrack and end up admitting, like modus vivendi liberals, that we cannot use our critical faculties to reach a universal consensus on what constitutes the good life. What really gives progressive liberals a more hopeful outlook than modus vivendi liberals is how they think about individual rights and the state's ability to do social engineering in service of those rights. They have a more expansive view of rights, especially regarding their belief that everyone has a right to equal opportunity. They also believe that governments have both a responsibility and the ability to pursue policies that ensure that outcome. Their faith in government's capacity to act in instrumentally rational ways sets them apart from modus vivendi liberals who have no such faith. Progressive liberals also recognize the need for the state to act as a night watchman, since they understand that it is not possible to achieve consensus on first principles. Progressive liberalism has its roots in the Enlightenment, which, as Isaac Kramnik notes, valorized the individual and the moral legitimacy of self-interest, but also trumpeted the importance of unassisted human reason, not faith or tradition. As Jeremy Waldron put it, the relationship between liberal thought and the legacy of the Enlightenment cannot be stressed too strongly. The Enlightenment was characterized by a burgeoning confidence in the human ability to make sense of the world, to grasp its regularities and fundamental principles, to predict its future, and to manipulate its powers for the benefit of mankind. The most prominent progressive liberals over the past 50 years include Ronald Dworkin, Francis Fukuyama, Steven Pinker, and John Rawls. Fukuyama's famous 1989 article, The End of History, which argued that with the fall of communism, the question of the ideal form of government had largely been answered in favor of liberal democracy is an outstanding example of this genre. Rawls, of course, was one of the most influential political philosophers of modern times, while Dworkin was a giant among legal philosophers. Pinker is probably the most famous proponent of the claim that the triumph of reason and liberal values has played a key role in reducing violence around the world. Going back further in time, 
The French philosopher Nicolas de Condorcet fits in this category, as does Immanuel Kant, who wrote, Have courage to use your own reason. That is the motto of enlightenment. The Power of Reason Many progressive liberals believe reason, coupled with certain discoverable principles, is the key to making the world a better place, a conviction reflected in Dworkin's comment that liberalism cannot be based on skepticism. There are actually two variants of progressive liberalism, each with a different take on what our critical faculties can tell us. Let us call them bounded and unbounded progressives. The unbounded progressives have the most faith in reason. They claim that when we collectively discover first principles and couple them with universal respect for individual rights, it effectively takes violent conflict off the table. Bounded progressives, while they have more faith in reason than modus vivendi liberals, do not think people around the world can reach a consensus on questions about the good life. But they do believe people in liberal societies are smart enough to accept those differences and not fight over them. Abundant tolerance accompanied by peaceful conflict resolution and respect for the law governs daily life wherever liberalism reigns. Both kinds of progressivism have an unrealistic understanding of what our critical faculties can do for us. It is not possible to argue, at least not successfully, that there are truths about first principles that virtually everyone accepts, nor is there any basis for believing that reason alone can produce profound tolerance in liberal societies, which is not to say that liberal institutions cannot socialize people to be highly tolerant, respect the law, and settle their conflicts peacefully. Moreover, a careful examination of their writings shows that progressive liberals themselves recognize the limits of reason, in effect undermining their own optimistic claims. Unbounded Progressivism The writings of Dworkin, Fukuyama, and Pinker contain arguments that fit with unbounded progressivism. As I noted earlier, Dworkin pays much attention to the question of whether it is possible for Supreme Court justices to come up with right answers for the hard cases that invariably make their way to them. Specifically, he is concerned with whether there are universal moral principles that can provide objectively correct answers in these cases, rather than answers that depend on particular justices' value preferences. He believes that there is a set of liberal constitutive principles that justices can employ to help get the right answers. The occasions when a legal question has no right answer in our own legal system, he writes, may be much rarer than is generally supposed. He goes on to say that, in a complex and comprehensive legal system, it is antecedently unlikely that two theories will differ sufficiently to demand different answers in some cases and yet provide equally good fit with the relevant legal materials. It is also worth noting that after saying liberalism cannot be grounded on skepticism, Dworkin argues that liberalism's Constitutive morality provides that human beings must be treated as equals by their government, not because there is no right and wrong in political morality, but because that is what is right. One could point to other examples of Dworkin making the case for universal truths. In his famous writings about the end of history, Fukuyama appears to make even bolder claims. History's end, goes the argument, means there would be no further progress in the development of underlying principles and institutions because all of the really big questions had been settled. With the triumph of Western liberal democracy over all other political forms, Fukuyama writes, we have reached the end point of mankind's ideological evolution. In the universal homogeneous state, all prior contradictions are resolved and all human needs are satisfied. There is no struggle or conflict over large issues and consequently no need for generals or statesmen. What remains is primarily economic activity. Given a world where people have no meaningful disagreements over first principles, their biggest problem is likely to be boredom. It hardly needs mentioning that boredom has not yet descended upon us. Finally, Pinker, who emphasizes what he calls the escalator of reason, has the earmarks of an unbounded progressive. Believe it or not, he tells us, we are getting smarter and smarter people are more liberal. One important implication of our psychological commonality is that however much people differ, there can be, in principle, a meeting of the minds. The reason is simple. When cosmopolitan currents bring diverse people into discussion, when freedom of speech allows the discussion to go where it pleases, and when history's failed experiments are held up to the light, the evidence suggests that value systems evolve in the direction of liberal humanism.
the case for unbounded progressivism is ultimately unpersuasive. There has never been anything approximating a universal consensus on what constitutes the good life, and no good reason to think there ever will be. The argument that we can use our critical faculties to divine universally accepted truths regarding first principles simply cannot be sustained. This is not to deny that individuals can come up with beliefs they deem ultimate truths, but getting everyone else to accept their views is another matter. Nor is it to deny that it is possible to get large groups of people to reach a consensus on public issues that matter to them. But even that is difficult, and it falls far short of universal agreement. Waldron drives this point home in his critique of Dworkin's views on truth in the legal realm. None of this talk about objectivity makes the slightest dent on the fact that different judges asking and answering the objective questions of value that Dworkin's jurisprudence require will come up with different answers. In other words, the answers will differ depending on the person, not depending on the law. Given reason's obvious limits, it is unsurprising that unbounded progressives themselves ultimately retreat from their bold assertions and begin to sound like modus vivendi liberals. Unfortunately, their bouncing back and forth on this critical matter is untenable. One has to choose between the opposite approaches. Either one believes universal truths about first principles are attainable, or one does not. Fukuyama's writings about the end of history provide what is probably the best example of this phenomenon. As noted, he argues in his well-known 1989 article that all of the big questions have been settled and that little remains to fight about. But while he repeats these claims in his 1992 follow-up book, he also contradicts himself with numerous statements that could easily come from a modus vivendi liberal. In his book, for example, Fukuyama makes much of the intellectual impasse in which modern relativism has left us, which he says does not permit defense of liberal rights traditionally understood. At another point, he writes, the incoherence in our current discourse on the nature of rights springs from a deeper philosophical crisis concerning the possibility of a rational understanding of man. Today, everybody talks about human dignity, but there is no consensus as to why people possess it. One cannot talk about the relativist impasse of modern thought, and yet argue there is broad agreement on first principles. Elsewhere in his book, Fukuyama warns about the dangers ahead, but these do not include boredom. He writes, for example, Looking backward, we who live in the old age of mankind might come to the following conclusion. No regime, no socioeconomic system, is able to satisfy all men in all places. This includes liberal democracy. Rather, the dissatisfaction arises precisely where democracy has triumphed most unboundedly. It is a dissatisfaction with liberty and equality. Thus, those who remain dissatisfied will always have the potential to restart history. More pointedly, he notes, modern thought raises no barriers to a future nihilistic war against liberal democracy on the part of those brought up in its bosom. Along the same lines, he posits that it is not clear that there will be any end to new and potentially more radical challenges to liberal democracy based on other forms of inequality. And possibly his most striking claim is that we have no guarantees and cannot assure future generations that there will be no future Hitlers or Pol Pots. Stephen Holmes succinctly sums up the consequences of taking these contradictory positions. Fukuyama does not seem to understand that all these preemptive concessions amount to an admission of defeat. This tendency to employ opposing views about the power of reason also appears in Kant's work, which explains why some scholars classify him as a modus vivendi liberal, while others see him as a progressive. Both Deborah Bokayanis and Kenneth Waltz, for instance, say Kant is a modus vivendi liberal, while Michael Desch and John Gray portray him as a progressive liberal. The reason for this confusion, as Waltz points out, is that Kant's writings give you ammunition to support both perspectives. In sum, the unbounded progressives' profound optimism about our ability to reason is undermined by their own writings and also by their failure to offer a compelling explanation for why human nature has changed so profoundly in just a few centuries. Bounded Progressivism With the second variant of progressive liberalism, reason does not yield consensus about life's big questions but it does produce deep tolerance of opposing views. Rawls is the most important bounded progressive. He makes it clear that he believes citizens in liberal societies do not have a comprehensive conception of the good, 
there is no agreement, he maintains, about universal principles having validity in all parts of moral and political life. Indeed, he expects citizens in a liberal society to be profoundly divided by reasonable religious, philosophical, and moral doctrines. Moreover, he does not expect all of the reasonable comprehensive doctrines found in a liberal society to be liberal comprehensive doctrines. Nevertheless, Rawls firmly believes not only that citizens in a liberal state have a certain moral character, but that they are eminently sensible, which means they will not fight over their irreconcilable comprehensive doctrines, but will instead be constrained by their sense of what is reasonable. In the end, public reason will lead them to reach compromise solutions and respect each other's views. As reasonable citizens, they will offer to cooperate on fair terms with other citizens. This deeply embedded norm of toleration in liberal societies, he writes, will lead to reasonable pluralism, if not a realistic utopia. The two variants of progressive liberalism differ markedly in their emphasis on tolerance. For bound progressives, tolerance acts as a magic elixir and is obviously of central importance. It is less important for unbounded progressives, who assume, at least much of the time, that broad agreement on first principles may make it unnecessary. There is little need to worry about tolerating difference in a world with no meaningful differences. Any society will surely harbor a few oddballs who do not recognize the truth. But unbounded progressives will not be inclined to tolerate their misguided views. Instead, they will want to coax or coerce them into seeing the light. Bounded progressivism is intuitively more attractive simply because it acknowledges the difficulty of reaching universal agreement on foundational questions. Still, there are problems with its expectation that tolerance in liberal societies will trump the intense passions generated by fundamental disagreements over first principles. For starters, there is little evidence that citizens in liberal societies are as tolerant as Rawls and other bounded progressives claim, and much evidence that they are not. The political philosopher George Klosko who directly engages Rawls's claims about tolerance, argues that the evidence shows many liberal citizens are remarkably intolerant, an argument he supports with abundant evidence. Klosko notes that this point should not be surprising to anyone familiar with research in American public opinion. I will say more about this in the next chapter when I discuss the overselling of individual rights, but suffice it to say here that there is no empirical basis for bounded progressivism's claims about deep tolerance. Rawls does not argue that people have a natural inclination toward reasonableness or tolerance. He clearly believes the world is populated by non-liberal as well as liberal societies, and that people living in non-liberal societies are not reasonable by the standards of liberal societies. For example, he talks about decent societies as well as outlaw states that are aggressive and dangerous. Regarding the beliefs of those individuals who populate decent societies, he writes, I do not say they are reasonable, but rather, they are not fully unreasonable. One would assume people living in outlaw states, at least most of them, are mostly unreasonable. The simple fact that huge numbers of people in the world are not reasonable by Rawls's own standards can only mean he does not believe people are naturally reasonable. This point is reinforced by Rawls's views on the history of the concept of tolerance. Specifically, he acknowledges that intolerance, not tolerance, was commonplace before Locke and others began formulating liberal theory in the 17th century. Until then, intolerance was accepted as a condition of social order and stability. There was, Rawls writes, a centuries-long practice of intolerance. Thus, the prevalence of reasonableness and tolerance in liberal societies cannot be a product of human nature. Something else must account for it. Where do reasonableness and tolerance come from in liberal societies? On what basis does Rawls claim that liberal citizens have a certain moral character? He does not say much about these important questions. His main claim seems to be that reasonable pluralism, which has tolerance deeply embedded in it, is largely the result of the socialization that takes place over time inside liberal societies. It is the long-term outcome of a society's culture in the context of free institutions. But this line of argument fails to say where the serious commitment to tolerance came from in the first place, as well as who is responsible for purveying that norm. One might suppose the state is principally responsible for shaping its citizens' behavior, but Rawls does not make that argument, and he tends to play down the role of the state in his theory. Moreover, it is hard to believe that the state, or any institution, 
could purvey a norm like tolerance so effectively that it would largely eliminate violent conflict over competing views of the good life. In short, Rawls provides no good answer for how reasonableness, one of the main driving forces in his theory, comes to flourish in liberal societies. Not surprisingly, he offers little empirical support for his bold claims about tolerance. Nor is it surprising that Rawls, like the unbounded progressives, occasionally makes arguments that contradict his fundamental claims about the peacefulness of liberal societies and leave him sounding like a modus vivendi liberal. For example, certain truths, it may be said, concern things so important that differences about them have to be fought out, even should this mean civil war. He also notes that because large numbers of people reject liberalism, there are important limits to reconciliation, adding that many persons could not be reconciled to a social world such as I have described. For them, the social world envisaged by political liberalism is a nightmare of social fragmentation and false doctrines, if not positively evil. Furthermore, Rawls fully accepts that liberal states sometimes face a supreme emergency that requires liberalism to be abandoned, or at least seriously curtailed. Where does this leave us? While there is no question that progressive liberals sometimes make bold claims about the power of our critical faculties, those claims do not stand up to close inspection. Although the claims of bounded progressives are more limited, the two versions share the same flaws. Neither provides a persuasive explanation for why reason can offer final answers to questions about the good life or promote prodigious tolerance in liberal societies. Instead, theorists in this tradition make their cases mainly by assertion. Second, both bounded and unbounded progressives sometimes make arguments that contradict their assertions about how reason ameliorates conflict and leave them sounding like modus vivendi liberals. In the end, there is no meaningful difference between modus vivendi and progressive liberalism on the pacifying effects of reason. The real difference between these two variants of political liberalism involves how they think about individual rights and social engineering by the state. Rights and Social Engineering Modus vivendi and progressive liberals hardly differ on the centrality of individual rights, but they disagree over what those rights are and how to strike a balance when they come into conflict. Modus vivendi liberals emphasize negative rights, which largely involve freedom from government interference in individual action. Freedom to assemble, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech are good examples. The right to acquire and exchange private property is an especially important right for modus vivendi liberals, as reflected in the writings of Locke and Smith. This emphasis on individual freedom is also reflected in the writings of Friedrich Hayek, a canonical modus vivendi liberal. The first sentences of the first chapter of Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty, for example, read, We are concerned in this book with that condition of men in which coercion of some by others is reduced as much as possible in society. This state we shall describe throughout as a state of liberty or freedom. Unsurprisingly, Many modus vivendi liberals have an intense dislike of positive rights, which require a serious effort by the state to help its citizens. Positive rights make individuals subject to government actions, which aim to provide them with a good or service to which they have a right. These efforts have little to do with freedom from government interference and may even entail the opposite. A good example of a positive right, and the one that modus vivendi liberals especially loathe, is the right to equal opportunity. This involves the government taking action to maximize the likelihood that every person has the same level of resources to compete for success. The aim is not to guarantee equal outcomes, just equal opportunity. Hayek reveals modus vivendi liberalism's hostility toward the notion of equal opportunity when he writes, Equality of the general rule of law and conduct is the only kind of equality conducive to liberty and the only equality which we can secure without destroying liberty. Not only has liberty nothing to do with any other sort of equality, but it is even bound to produce inequality in many respects. Modus vivendi liberals not only believe there is no such thing as an inalienable right to equal opportunity, but also think the state is ill-equipped to provide it, and, as Hayek notes, efforts to do so may even cause inequality. Governments, they maintain, should not be in the business of promoting positive rights which they feel are not even legitimate rights. Progressive liberals are committed to the same set of basic freedoms that are at the core of modus vivendi liberalism, but then they add other rights. Equal opportunity is a dominating theme in the writings of both Dworkin and Rawls, 
for whom it is synonymous with fairness, which they believe is what justice is all about. And they care greatly about justice. Rawls's most famous book is titled A Theory of Justice, and Dworkin uses Liberalism and Justice as the title for the section in A Matter of Principle, where he explores the present state of liberal theory. Modus vivendi liberals rarely talk about justice. Progressive liberals believe in other positive rights as well, such as the right to health care, the right to a decent education, and the right to live free of poverty. To some extent, these rights are linked with the quality of opportunity, as it is hard to achieve success if you grow up impoverished or lack a good education or good health. One could also argue, of course, that these are important rights independent of what they mean for equal opportunity. One problem with promoting positive rights, however, is that they sometimes conflict with negative rights. This is especially true of equal opportunity, which often conflicts with the right to private property. Any meaningful effort to foster equal opportunity involves a significant redistribution of a society's resources. That means taking money, which is private property, from the rich and transferring it to the poor. Progressive liberals hardly hesitate to tax the rich to foster equal opportunity, which is not to say they do not recognize the right to property. They do. But they do not accord that right the same importance that modus vivendi liberals do. Rawls does not emphasize individual property rights in his writing, especially compared with Locke and Smith, for whom it is sacrosanct. The two kinds of liberalism also have fundamental differences, directly related to their different views of rights, over the role of the state and social engineering. Modus vivendi liberals, who want the state to maintain order while doing everything possible to maximize individual freedom, do not want social engineering, and they certainly do not want a welfare state built around positive rights. Progressive liberals recognize the need for a state to act as a night watchman, but they also wanted to promote positive rights for the purpose of enhancing individual welfare. This, in their view, is the best way to promote the overall well-being of society. That is what makes them progressive liberals. Their state will rely heavily on experts, many in its direct employ, and others who serve as consultants from their positions in academia or think tanks. Many of these experts will be social scientists, since, after all, the state is doing social engineering. While progressive liberals are certainly interested in building an interventionist state that can affect civil society in profound ways, they remain wary of big government. They do not lionize the state the way a philosopher like Hegel does, mainly because they recognize that it has the potential to turn into a leviathan and threaten individual freedoms. In short, progressive liberals have a conflicted view of the state. They fear it even while treating it as a major force for good. Progressive liberals' great faith in the ability of states to do social engineering says, in effect, that they place a high premium on instrumental rationality. They believe people can use their critical faculties to come up with smart strategies for achieving ambitious social goals. Modus vivendi liberals have little faith in government social engineering, which is to say they have less confidence in the state's ability to act in instrumentally rational ways. This clear difference about the sway of instrumental rationality notwithstanding, modus vivendi and progressive liberals agree on substantive rationality, that reason cannot help us divine collective truths about the good life. As I noted earlier, politics is always at play in a liberal society. Because the state must make at least some rules and laws that deal with first principles, it matters to the citizenry who among them runs the government. People living in a state dominated by progressive liberals will care more about this because the progressive state will insert itself more in civil society. The intensity of political competition is likely to be greater in states where progressive, rather than modus vivendi liberals, are in charge. In such circumstances, modus vivendi liberals will have a powerful incentive to engage in politics so as to limit the interventionist state. The bottom line is that the key differences in political liberalism's two variants are how they think about rights and the role of the state. Over the past two centuries, the balance of power between them has shifted decisively in favor of progressive liberalism. The Triumph of Liberal Progressivism In its original form, political liberalism was synonymous with modus vivendi liberalism, but that variant gradually fell out of favor, partly because a laissez-faire approach to governing led to extreme economic inequality and widespread poverty. Moreover, for reasons I will discuss, it was an unsuitable blueprint for administering an industrialized nation-state. Utilitarianism and liberal idealism emerged in good part as responses to modus vivendi liberalism's shortcomings. 
progressive liberalism was also an alternative to modus vivendi liberalism, and by the early 20th century, it was the dominant form of political liberalism in American and British politics. Its king of thought is John Rawls. The key indicator of liberal progressivism's triumph is that the interventionist state, committed in its liberal form to fostering economic opportunity as well as other positive rights, is here to stay. Yet progressive liberalism has not won such a decisive victory as to render modus vivendi liberalism irrelevant. Modus vivendi liberalism has a substantial following in every liberal society, and its advocates sometimes have a significant influence on public discourse. But in practice, the best its proponents can do is to curb the excesses of the interventionist state. There is virtually no hope of replacing it with a state that eschews social engineering and positive rights. Progressivism in America The American case shows us why. Liberal progressivism was a powerful force in U.S. politics in the late 19th and especially the early 20th centuries. The Republican Party, which was the dominant party until the 1932 presidential election, was closely identified with progressivism. Several constitutional amendments in this era, to authorize the federal income tax, elect senators by popular vote, give women the vote, and prohibit the sale of alcohol, emerged from progressive initiatives. Even Herbert Hoover, contrary to the conventional wisdom, was deeply committed to social engineering when he was Secretary of Commerce from 1921 to 1928 and as President from 1929 to 1933. There is no question, however, that liberal progressivism has had its ups and downs and that its adherents' initial optimism has waned over time. But overall, the U.S. government has remained deeply engaged in social engineering. Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, 1933-38, and Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, 1964-65, were extremely ambitious attempts at social engineering, aimed at promoting positive rights. To understand how thoroughly progressivism has triumphed, consider how liberalism relates to the major political parties in the United States today. The Democratic Party's ruling ideology is clearly progressive liberalism, and it acts accordingly when it controls the key levers of power in Washington. If you listen to Republicans, you might think they follow the dictates of modus vivendi liberalism. That is usually true of their rhetoric, but it is not how they govern. In office, Republicans act like Democrats. For example, the annualized growth of federal spending since 1982 grew more under Republican presidents Reagan, Bush 41, and Bush 43, then Democrats, Clinton and Obama. It grew by 8.7% under Reagan between 1982 and 1985, but only 1.4% under Obama between 2010 and 2013. Reagan also signed into law in 1986 the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, which prohibits hospitals from turning away people who come to an emergency room for treatment. It does not matter whether those individuals are American citizens, what their legal status is, or whether they can afford the treatment. In effect, this law says that health care is a human right. In fact, Reagan said as early as 1961 that any person in the United States who requires medical attention and cannot provide it for himself should have it provided for him. Further evidence that Republicans recognize this right comes from the often repeated slogan, Repeal and Replace. They understand they cannot simply eliminate the Affordable Care Act but must substitute another system that aims to provide Americans with decent health care. Republican presidents oversaw the beginnings of the interstate highway system, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Homeland Security. Republicans, in short, are deeply committed to the interventionist state and the extensive social engineering that comes with it. The United States does have a political party that is genuinely committed to modus vivendi liberalism, and it is appropriately called the Libertarian Party. It is dedicated to promoting civil liberties and laissez-faire capitalism and to abolishing the welfare state. Its party platform takes dead aim at positive rights. We seek a world of liberty, a world in which all individuals are sovereign over their own lives and no one is forced to sacrifice his or her values for the benefit of others. The Libertarian Party has never won a single seat in Congress and never come close to winning the White House. Its candidate in the 2016 presidential election received 3.3% of the vote. Even if the libertarians ever did gain power, they would surely find themselves prisoners of the interventionist state and its ambitious social programs. Why Progressivism Won Progressivism won out over modus vivendi liberalism 
because the profound changes that began sweeping across the world in the early 19th century forced states to build large-scale institutions dedicated to social engineering. For liberal democracies, this engineering included intervention in civil society to promote rights. These new roles were facilitated by the state's increasing capacity to handle them. For example, improvements in communications and transportation made it increasingly easy for governments to penetrate civil society. Walter Lippmann, writing in 1914, captured the spirit of the times. We can no longer treat life as something that has trickled down to us. We have to deal with it deliberately, devise its social organization, alter its tools, formulate its method, educate, and control it. Three major forces drove progressive liberalism's ascendancy. The first was the Industrial Revolution, which started in England in the 18th century and continues even today to generate enormous economic and social change. Among other things, it led to the rise of large-scale enterprises, manufacturing companies, financial firms, trade associations, research universities, and labor unions, to name a few, that profoundly affected the lives of millions of people. John Dewey put the point well. The new technology applied in production and commerce resulted in a social revolution. The local communities without intent or forecast found their affairs conditioned by remote and invisible organizations. Another consequence of industrialization, the aforementioned growth in communication and transportation networks, occurred not just at the national level, but at the international level as well. The Industrial Revolution helped fuel globalization, which meant that major economic developments in any one country inevitably affected other countries in the system and made the world increasingly interdependent. Industrialization also led to child labor, worker exploitation, and environmental damage. Given these and other hugely consequential developments, the state had no choice but to get seriously involved in managing various aspects of society, including the economy. Given the sheer size of the relevant enterprises, the speed at which technology changes, and the global nature of industrial capitalism, the necessary levels of planning and regulating were far beyond the capacities of local governments. Much to the chagrin of modus vivendi liberals, relying on the invisible hand to work its magic in the economy, is not a feasible strategy. Liberal countries might be wedded to capitalism and a market economy, but that does not prevent the interventionist state from closely regulating not only its own economy, but the international economy as well. These tasks involve making and implementing policies that unavoidably affect individual rights. The second key force behind the triumph of progressive liberalism is nationalism, which, like industrialization, became a dominating force in international politics during the 19th century. I will discuss nationalism at length in the next chapter, but suffice it to say here that all states have powerful reasons, administrative, economic, and military, to foster in their people a strong sense of nationhood, which requires extensive social engineering. This task never ends, not only because newly born citizens have to be socialized, but also because some states allow large-scale immigration. Moreover, most states are multinational, which means they have to work assiduously to forge a common identity among their different groups. At the same time, nationalism creates powerful bonds between citizens and the state, leading people to expect their government to reward their loyalty by providing for their welfare. This demand reinforces the nation-state's inclination toward intervention, which includes, in liberal democracies, the promotion of rights. Democracy further bolsters this interventionism. Voters demand that politicians put forward policies that promote their welfare, and politicians who make bold promises and deliver on them are likely to get elected and re-elected. This popular pressure causes most politicians to favor, or at least not fervently oppose, policies that promote equal opportunity and other positive rights. The third major force behind progressive liberalism's dominance is the changing nature of welfare and the need to maintain a large peacetime military establishment. Modern militaries invariably contain large numbers of individuals in uniform, as well as numerous civilian employees, and rely on a vast and constantly changing arsenal of sophisticated weaponry that today, for several states, include massively destructive nuclear weapons. They depend as well on manufacturing, logistics, and services from private businesses, creating what Dwight Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. The state has no choice but to manage this behemoth, because the military is an integral part of the state. The need to fill the ranks of the military with healthy and well-educated citizens 
gives the government a powerful incentive to provide for the welfare of its citizenry, and it must then provide for the welfare of those citizens who end up wearing a uniform. When these modern militaries fight major wars, especially total wars like the two world wars, the state ends up interfering in almost every aspect of daily life. The government has little alternative if it hopes to mobilize the resources necessary to win. The result, however, is that the state discovers its ability to do social engineering on a grand scale. As the sociologist Morris Janowitz notes regarding World War II, a society that could mobilize for total war was defined as one that could mobilize for social welfare. Thus, it was the actual performance of the central government during the war that was crucial in the thrust toward a welfare state. In essence, the political elites gained the knowledge and the confidence that they could manage the welfare state. Even when states become involved in protracted conflicts that do not involve the clashing of mass armies, like the Cold War and the so-called Global War on Terror, they still interfere profoundly in civil society. During the Cold War, for example, blatant racism against African Americans in the United States made it difficult for American policymakers to promote the U.S. political system internationally as superior to communism. As the legal historian Mary Dudziak notes, at a time when the United States hoped to reshape the post-war world in its own image, the international attention given to racial segregation was troublesome and embarrassing. The need to rectify this problem played an important role in propelling the civil rights movement, as Richard Nixon explicitly acknowledged when he was vice president under Eisenhower. In other words, civil rights reform was in part a product of the Cold War because that change was consistent with and important to the more central mission of fighting world communism. When wars end, the returning soldiers often make demands on the state. For example, veterans who come from groups that have been denied the right to vote are likely to demand it. As the historian Alexander Kisar notes, nearly all of the major expansions of the franchise that have occurred in American history took place either during or in the wake of wars. The historical record indicates that this was not a coincidence. The demands of both war itself and preparedness for war created powerful pressures to enlarge the right to vote. Armies had to be recruited, often from the so-called lower orders of society, and it was historically as well as practically difficult to compel men to bear arms while denying them the franchise. Similarly, Conducting a war meant mobilizing popular support, which gave political leverage to any social groups excluded from the polity. Returning soldiers also make claims for pensions, health care, and educational benefits. After the American Civil War, for example, the Bureau of Pensions, which handled military pensions, became one of the largest and most active agencies of the federal government. As the sociologist Theta Scotchpole notes, by the early 20th century, Many American voters and citizens appear to have wanted to extend this policy precedent into more widely available old-age pensions. In 1930, the Bureau of Pensions became part of the new Veterans Administration, which today has roughly 350,000 employees and a budget of over $150 billion. Following World War II, countless American veterans went to college on the GI Bill, which also benefited veterans of the wars in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. In short, national security considerations forced liberal states not only to engage in large-scale social engineering, but also to promote individual rights. Both efforts foster progressive liberalism. In the modern world, modus vivendi liberalism cannot survive contact with an enemy. Political liberalism today is effectively synonymous with progressive liberalism, and modus vivendi liberalism can only hope to shape progressivism, not replace it. Before turning to a critique of political liberalism, I want to briefly examine utilitarianism and liberal idealism, which are sometimes portrayed as liberal theories, but, at least under my definition, are not. Utilitarianism Jeremy Bentham is the intellectual father of utilitarianism, although he is hardly the only luminary in that tradition, which includes James Mill, his son John Stuart Mill, Henry Sidgwick, and many others. Advocates of this ism maintain that the primary goal of politics is to find ways of promoting the overall happiness of society. Happiness is the utility in this theory, and the key goal for leaders is to promote policies that contribute to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Utilitarianism treats all citizens as equals in the sense that no individual's desires are favored over another's. John Stuart Mill is something of an exception, 
as he argues for privileging intellectual over physical pleasures. Very importantly, the stark individualism central to political liberalism is absent from utilitarianism. People are instead treated as social beings from the start, and the general well-being of the collectivity is political leaders' main concern. Given that utilitarians reject the liberal emphasis on individualism, it is not surprising they also reject the liberal conception of natural rights. Bentham's downright hostility toward inalienable rights led him to criticize both the American Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. None of this is to say rights do not matter for utilitarians, because they do. But they are determined by the government, they are not natural rights. Furthermore, the primary purpose of rights is to promote the general welfare, not to give individuals maximum freedom to pursue their own interests. In other words, rights are important for maximizing collective utility, not because individual freedom is good in itself. This means not only that individual rights are doled out by the state, but also that they can be circumscribed when they no longer serve the common good. This is a far cry from how political liberals think about rights. Leaders play an essential role in the utilitarian story, as they are principally responsible for assessing their constituents' desires and then cutting deals with groups and individuals to maximize the aggregate stock of happiness of the community. In effect, bargaining is at the core of utilitarianism which means there will have to be trade-offs between the interests of different actors as well as between rights. There is a clear sense in utilitarianism that virtually all interests are, as Deborah Bokoyanis puts it, negotiable, divisible, and exchangeable. The utilitarian world is not one where individuals are fervently committed to first principles or moral truths. Its people are mainly concerned with finding happiness while the government is concerned with determining what pleases them so as to design policies to achieve that end. Some people may have strong passions about life's big questions, but not many can have them simply because passionate beliefs would make it difficult to make the trade-offs necessary for maximizing everyone's happiness. While reason has little to do with determining what makes people happy, reason matters greatly for figuring out the best way to maximize collective utility. Utilitarians, therefore, place great emphasis on instrumental rationality. Bentham makes this distinction clear. It is by hopes and fears that the ends of action are determined. All that reason does is to find and determine the means. Utilitarians are generally optimistic about the prospects of creating a peaceful and prosperous society. Much of their optimism comes from the belief that most people are intelligent and reasonable and thus capable of doing the right thing. James Mill succinctly summarizes this perspective. When various conclusions are, with their evidence, presented with equal care and with equal skill, there is a moral certainty, though some few may be misguided, that the greatest number will judge right and the greatest form of evidence, whatever it is, will produce the greatest impression. In other words, public opinion is a powerful force for good. Moreover, utilitarians have a progressive view of history, which further reinforces their belief that people will realize they have a harmony of interests. As John Stuart Mill notes, utilitarianism is grounded on the permanent interests of man as a progressive being. The state's principal role in utilitarianism is to manage the bargaining process. The government must be concerned with important matters like determining how wealth and resources are distributed and which rights should be privileged over others. This is not a laissez-faire state that depends on the invisible hand to produce favorable outcomes. The hand here is visible, interventionist, and actively engaged in social engineering. Utilitarians, however, do not place much emphasis on the state acting as a night watchman, mainly because they do not believe there are profound differences about what constitutes the good life. Instead, the state's main function is to ensure that everyone gets a fair shake and ends up maximizing their pleasure. In sum, utilitarianism differs in essential ways from political liberalism and thus falls outside this book's purview. Liberal Idealism Liberal idealism is another ism that some classify as a liberal theory. Its founding father is the British philosopher T.H. Green, whose many followers in Britain include Bernard Posonque, L.T. Hobhouse, J.A. Hobson, and D.G. Ritchie. The two key liberal idealists who wrote about international politics were Gilbert Murray and Alfred Zimmern. The leading liberal idealist in the United States in the early 20th century was John Dewey, who was deeply influenced by Green's writings. 
This theoretical approach has been carried on in the contemporary Anglo-Saxon world by scholars such as Gerald Gauss, Stephen Macedo, and Jack Crittenden, who writes in Beyond Individualism, 1992, The view of liberalism that I am offering here, liberalism beyond individualism, is a continuation of the revisioning of liberalism undertaken by T.H. Green and his disciples and by John Dewey in America. Why Liberal Idealists Are Liberals in Name Only There is little doubt that liberal idealists are literally idealists, as the label indicates, but they are not political liberals. There is no room in their theory for liberalism's unambiguous individualism and its accompanying belief in inalienable rights. Liberal idealists emphasize that human beings are first and foremost social animals. According to Green, men in detachment from social relations would not be men at all, or as Dewey put it, only by working for the common good can individual human beings realize their true individualities and become truly free. Green's and Dewey's comments make it clear that although liberal idealists are committed to maintaining as much individual freedom as possible, they see individuals above all else as social beings. This view is what attracted them to Hegel, who was clearly an important influence on virtually all the early thinkers in this tradition. Hegel, of course, has an organic view of society, although he also cares much about individual rights. As is clear from his famous tract, The Philosophy of Right, he believes individual freedom and social unity are not at odds with each other, but can be joined together to produce a vibrant body politic. A few liberal idealists, Hobhaus and Hobson being the most prominent, agree with Hegel that it is possible to design an organic society that allows its citizens to take maximum advantage of their individual rights. But that merger of opposites is not possible. Liberalism and liberal idealism look at the relationship between individuals and their society in contradictory ways. Any country committed to promoting social unity has to place significant limits on freedom or rights. It is not that rights have no place in liberal idealism, but that they must be circumscribed in important ways if the society is to foster interdependence and cooperation among its citizens, rather than egoistic behavior designed to maximize individual utility. Given the primacy of society in liberal idealist thinking, coupled with the increasing influence of nationalist sentiment in Europe during the latter half of the 19th century, it is not surprising that patriotism figures prominently in the writings of many liberal idealists. They treat it as a force for good, as a highly effective means of unifying a society. Bosanquet, for example, claims that patriotism is an immense natural force, a magical spell, which grows from family and kindred, the tie of blood. While Green extols what two contemporary British scholars call cosmopolitan nationalism. For Green, the love of mankind needs to be particularized in order to have any power over life and action. E. H. Carr maintains that one reason for the liberal idealist blithe view of nationalism was that there were not many nations at the time, so they were not yet visibly jostling one another. While Carr was probably correct, nationalism was also widely admired because it was seen to embody popular sovereignty, which is closely tied to democracy. It played a key role before and after the turn of the century in toppling dynastic rulers all across Europe. Dewey, who was deeply committed to nationalizing education, captures this perspective when he writes, The upbuilding of national states has substituted a unity of feeling and aim, a freedom of intercourse, over wide areas for earlier local isolations, suspicions, jealousies, and hatreds. It has forced men out of narrow sectionalisms into membership in a larger social unit, and created loyalty to a state which subordinates petty and selfish interests. Over time, and surely after World War I, liberal idealists grew more aware of nationalism's dark side. In 1916, Dewey contrasted the good aspect of nationalism with its evil side. Two years later, Zimmern used True and False Nationalism as the title of a chapter of a book about promoting international peace. Nonetheless, liberal idealists continued to view nationalism, on balance, as a positive force. In the same book, for example, Zimmern writes, Nationalism, rightly understood and cherished, is a great uplifting and life-giving force, a bulwark alike against chauvinism and against materialism, against all the decivilizing impersonal forces which harass and degrade the minds and souls of modern men. Given liberal idealism's organic conception of society, it fits neatly with nationalism.
one point of agreement between political liberals, especially modus vivendi liberals and liberal idealists, concerns their fear of a too powerful state. Hegel revered the state, calling it the actuality of concrete freedom. The state also plays a central role in nationalism, as we will see in the next chapter. Given liberal idealism's close links with both Hegel and nationalism, one would expect liberal idealists to favor a formidable state with abundant capacity to intervene in civil society for the common good. In fact, they embrace the notion of a strong state only reluctantly and tend to worry that a state with too much power will bring serious trouble. This is one reason liberal idealists do not fully embrace Hegel's teachings. Why Liberal Idealists Are Idealists The idealism embedded in the liberal idealist worldview is reflected in their deep-seated belief that politics is about the pursuit of moral goodness. What matters for them is the moral progress of man, not the utilitarian goal of maximizing happiness. Green contemptuously describes utilitarianism as hedonistic fatalism. He began his famous lectures on political obligation by saying, my purpose is to consider the moral function or object served by law or by the system of rights and obligations which the state enforces, and in so doing, to discover the true ground or justification for obedience to law. Other liberal idealists shared Green's emphasis on morality, although none could ever state what exactly the moral ideal looks like or what was involved in the perfecting of man. Probably the best answer is Hophouse's claim that the ideal society is conceived as a whole which lives and flourishes by the harmonious growth of its parts, each of which, in development on its own lines and in accordance with its own nature, tends on the whole to foster the development of others. Still, this is a rather vague prescription for future political life. Thus, it is not surprising that Green acknowledged his inability to nail down what human perfectibility would look like. But while it is impossible for us to say what the perfecting of man, of which the idea actuates the moral life, in its actual attainment might be, we can discern certain conditions which, if it is to satisfy the idea, it must fulfill. Liberal idealists also have a deep-rooted belief in reason as the key tool for realizing moral goodness. Utilitarians also privilege reason, but there is a subtle difference. Utilitarians tend to be elitists in the sense that they have great faith in the mental faculties of the governing elites who are principally responsible for crafting the bargains at the heart of the utilitarian enterprise. Liberal idealists appear to have more faith in the common people's ability to use their critical faculties in smart ways. As A.D. Lindsay writes in his introduction to Green's Principles of Political Obligation, Green and his fellow idealists had a profound belief in the worth and dignity of the ordinary man. Liberal idealists are invariably champions of democracy, while most utilitarians' enthusiasm is more restrained. Perhaps the most eloquent liberal idealist on how reason can help build the ideal society is Dewey, who was especially bullish on ordinary people's capabilities. He believed that given the right educational opportunities, the average individual would rise to undreamed heights of social and political intelligence. If those regular people were then brought together, the cumulative intelligence of a multitude of cooperating individuals would take society to even greater heights. He condemns violence as a tool of social change and instead extols intelligence as an alternative method of social action. For Dewey, organized intelligence can solve the crisis in democracy by resurrecting democratic ideals in pursuit of genuine democracy. Finally, the idealism of Green and his followers is reflected in their belief in nationalism as ultimately a benign force. Even in the aftermath of World War I, which was linked with nationalism in many people's minds, the dark side of that ism was largely shunted aside by liberal idealists. This approach is reflected in the writings of Murray and Zimmern, who were deeply committed to fostering international peace in the interwar period. They hoped to construct an international society in which the great powers would cooperate to improve each other's lot. Nationalism was a major force for good in their story, as reflected in Zimmern's comment that the road to internationalism lies through nationalism, and no theory or ideal of internationalism can be helpful in our thinking or effective in practice unless it is based on a right understanding of the place which national sentiment occupies and must always occupy in the life of mankind. More generally, for Zimmern and other liberal idealists, the power of reason kept passionate disagreements at bay, 
allowing states and the international system, like individuals in a society, to realize a natural harmony of interests. Thus, Murray and Zimmern saw no need for a commanding league of nations that would transcend anarchy and police the great powers through military might and the force of law, any more than they saw the need for a powerful state to keep individuals and groups from killing each other. Instead, as Gene Moorfield puts it, they saw the League as a natural extension of humanity's tendency toward social cohesion. This view may be fairly described as idealistic, if not utopian. It should be clear that liberal idealism differs in fundamental ways from political liberalism. Not only do liberal idealists view humans as essentially social animals, they also do not believe in natural rights and assign nationalism as an important place in their story. They believe reason can help facilitate moral progress, leading the way toward some kind of ideal society. These beliefs conflict with the core notions that underpin political liberalism, an ideology that merits an extended critique of its own. 4. Cracks in the Liberal Edifice Two of political liberalism's most salient features are also its two significant flaws, the prominence 